Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 596, that is 596 of the Agostino Zynga show. Hope you're doing well wherever this podcast is finding you. It's absolutely amazing to think about, isn't it? 596, I'm only four away from 600 episodes of me essentially blabbering into a microphone by myself into a camera. At the fir- when, when I first started, what was I doing it? I was doing it via a, dicta- a dictaphone right dictaphone or one of those kind of recorder handheld recorder things i'd get that i'd record my voice then i'd kind of um save that plug into a computer upload into garage band and then edit the podcast that way crazy thing to do so i'd basically have the dictaphone next to my laptop as i was typing and searching on things online and stuff which is obviously not the best audio experience but that's how i started and of course over that after that i didn't end up getting a usb microphone and now i'm at the point where i'm actually using a proper xlr mic so even if the audio you know, even if the video is a little bit shabby and the lighting is no great it's at least you can hear my set my voice clearly through this microphone which is obviously the main reason of doing this sort of stuff but bloody hell nearly 600 episodes of me talking absolute gobbledygook and i'm absolutely honored and pleased and grateful that any people listen to this at all really really am but yeah welcome back to the show welcome back to the show so um many things to kind of catch up on and talk about this week many little topics i haven't really touched upon on previous podcasts this may be a little bit of a long one so please bear with me but as per usual this is the number one cultural commentary podcast in the world where i touch on many different things that i stumble across on the internet thoughts and feelings from myself and general you know nonsense and of course if you like what you hear you like what you see please spread please let everybody know what i'm doing that'll be greatly appreciated so first things first out of the gate because this just literally happened um, i'm not sure some of you guys are aware but i do pay attention to the low cow community it's something that from afar just fascinates me um low cows are essentially you know um guys and gals online who have essentially turned themselves into pariahs socially you know, pariahs on the internet there are people that generally everyone on the internet kind of decries and they provide lols and they do stupid things and people just take the piss out of them in general and two of the kind of main ones i sort of follow are wings of redemption and dsp and essentially both of these guys have kind of gone out of their way to um, be as reprehensible of people as possible despite having the privilege of essentially having the dream career where you essentially get to stream every day and get people to send you money and essentially get to look after your family and friends that way which is you know something that everyone would like to do in some way shape or form but for some reason those two guys take it for granted or or sometimes feel like they're entitled to that kind of career and they do many you know disgusting things along the way but I think out of the two of them definitely I would say Dark Side Phil DSP is definitely the worst for me he is somebody who essentially essentially begs and pleads for his audience to give him tips and donations even though he makes anywhere between five to like 6k per month on adsense alone there's not watching someone's pockets because you know the information is out there um he essentially lies about his finances lies about his bills lies about how dis- you know how financially desolate he is in order to get his very susceptible fans to essentially donate to him and for whatever reason even though he's been doing this for what more than 10 years he has never really turned a corner nothing's ever enough despite making 10 sometimes you know 10 grand per month it doesn't seem like that the, the begging ever ever stops there are scams along the way there are occasions where he says a certain thing and his house is broken and he needs money to fix it and he raises the money he doesn't go and fix it or he just you know he basically flat out lied that that thing was broken in the first place and if you try and mention it again to him he'll ban you from his chat he essentially has insulated himself from all kind of feedback and criticism even his twitter now that i'm looking at on his page he's blocked and cancelled any replies so people can't reply to him as he follows you and he only follows like a handful of people i think how many 74 so literally no one else can reply to him on twitter essentially so uh, in my opinion a really reprehensible character but for whatever reason the internet seems to be more fixated with winter redemption i think maybe because winter redemption is like nearly 500 pounds right so he's a really fat dude and i think there's something there's something in our biology as people where we tend to sometimes have a bit more of an axe to grind with people who are bigger especially if they have a terrible attitude or act like their shit don't stink um and just are generally bad people right it could kind of come across a bit weird because you see that a lot with people who are in my five 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 hundred pound life you see them be a little bit manipulative you see them be conniving um some of them have sociopathic tendencies like really nasty people and sometimes you can't make you know head or tails of it you're like hold on you're fat why are you this 
horrible of a human essentially you you have essentially put yourself in a position or you know by the unluck of flipping genes you're in a position where you are relying on everyone's help and charity to ensure that you stay alive so the fact that you're a piece of shit doesn't really make any sense and the same goes for wings maybe but i think if you had to you know tally up or kind of judge or weigh up who is the worst person online in terms of streamers it definitely has to be dsp and now there's an interesting development because it looks like um wings as trolls the people who have been trolling wings and essentially copywriting his channel and trying to get him taken off the internet so he gets a job because that's essentially what the most of the trolls are essentially doing that's the essential end game i think is that they want to see these guys taken off of the platforms that they're on and demonetized channels deleted so that they have to go back to reality because for the most part they've been taking streaming and being online and having this amazing career for granted really or basically thinking they're entitled to it or thinking that the gravy train is just going to continue going on and on and on forever especially in dsp's age he's nearly four, he's actually 40 years old and there seems to be no exit plan he just wants to continue just turning on his streams doing fucking podcasts and level one pre-streams whatever nonsense he does asking for tips doing fucking what you call it um charity runs and watch fundraisers like nonsense stuff so it doesn't seem to end but anyway it seems like maybe there is going to be some sort of stumbling block i don't think end because these guys seem to be able to survive nuclear you know nuclear blast when it comes to their ability to bounce back from copyright strikes and you know people getting hold of their accounts and stuff it's quite eerie how good they are doing it but the latest development courtesy of dsp's account is as follows he tweeted just earlier about three hours ago he says oh i'm currently under attack with false copyright strikes on dsp gaming please give me a bit to figure this out as i have to see what just happened thanks so he's obviously worried and nervous now that his channel is going to get taken down because it looks like wings as trolls have now diverted their attention to dsp and let me tell you a little bit about that because in the detractor community a lot of people myself included think wings gets a lot more hassle than what he probably should get even though he's a reprehensible character too if you have to compare him to dsp dsp definitely deserves to get wings as treatment more than wings deserves to get wings treatment but for whatever reason, the, the Wings as trolls aren't really that bothered about taking him down. They just want to point and laugh, which is fine. But for the most part, some of them, there is a small faction of them that dev definitely want to see him get taken off of the internet or at least get, you know, mom momentarily have to pause in his begging and all that malarkey. Um, but now it looks like Wings as trolls have finally decided to turn their attention to DSP because Wings is just a, you know, it's just a waste of time and he's boring. So they've essentially turned their eye to DSP and they're now basically false copyright striking his um channel and we don't really know the reasons why he hasn't really specified that he went on the stream now recently talking about it and just sounding nuts and not really giving us details and doing the whole dsp thing of dancing around it being vague and talking about doxing whatever maybe but there are certain theories out there that most likely people are going back onto his channel because he's got so many flipping videos and i think they're like eight thousand or eighty thousand videos on his channel so just spits out absolute garbage but um essentially people have gone back to his channel and either um, taken down or copyright striked him based on maybe foul language of used or people have done what they've been doing for a long time here and there where because he gets submitted or he you no know, because he asks his fans to give him artwork that he wants to use for his streams but he doesn't pay them he's never paid for everything he doesn't pay mods he doesn't pay people when they send free graphics or emotes anything he just you know wants everything for free everything handed to him on a silver platter because that happens more often than not those people are usually trolls so they send him stuff they send him artwork to use for his channel he accepts it gladly because anything free he'll take and then he'll use it and then they'll turn around and then you know copyright strike him and say that he's illegally taken their artwork and not paid for it or whatever which is obviously technically true and then his channel gets taken down momentarily or he gets a strike on his account which is dumb so most likely it's what people are thinking is happening but we don't really know again because he's not clearing it up the next tweet that follows it says as follows um two hours ago dsp said dsp the reorganized absolute donor he says i'm currently assessing the damage of dsp gaming for false copyright strikes and i'm unable to tell yet if i can upload a stream so please be patient i have a plan in place so for now just sit tight thanks i'll get back to you shortly <laughs> he's so nervous because essentially he's he's kind of put himself into a situation where for whatever reason his monthly youtube paycheck which he just got paid recently because we all did so he got paid anywhere between three to six grand let's say just to be to have a safe estimate but it could be more for some reason he's put himself into a corner or made people believe that that 
three to five grand let's say check is not enough to cover all these bills and he has to beg and plead for tips every single day twice a day up to 150 per stream which is equivalent to 300 dollars he's expecting to get every single day from people to tip and donate to him so that he can essentially keep the lights on you know and support his family quote unquote which is essentially a wife and a cat which again i don't believe is a family but i have had other people on my channel tell me that they do refer to themselves having a partner and a pet to be a family right because once you have a pet especially someone that does have a pet i can't really relate but people say when you do have a pet you do actually treat them like a family member legitimately like an extension of you or a child or whatever it may be so fair enough but essentially there's there's no need you can easily survive you should be able to survive on five grand with just a wife and a cat there's no way you can have bills that would allow that would put you in a position where five grand wasn't enough because most people don't have the ability to even earn five grand so if you if you had to if you had to survive on two or one grand how would you survive then do you know what I mean it makes no, no sense but still this is the position that DSP's put himself in another tweet here said update I'm going to attempt to go live on DSP gaming in just a few minutes the vast majority of the discussion today will be about what to do regarding going going attacks on DSP maybe some gameplay but we'll see please come by if you can it'll be very important but it's Essentially, the whole stream that he did earlier on was just him pitying and basically begging and crying for help and essentially pleading with the copyright strikers to not to basically take away their copyright strikes, which is a pretty insane tactic to go about it because he's a very unlikable person. So he's asking people to basically do him a favor and leave him alone because he has a family to support. But then he's a very, very unlikable person. Like there's nothing, um, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing at all that you would there's no part of anybody that would ever feel bad for DSP. So the fact that he's trying to um, appeal to their good nature is a bit odd. But again, what else can he do in this situation? Because he's not going to research the issue. He's not going to be reflective. He's not going to be introspective. He's not going to look in the mirror and think, hey, why do people not like me? What can I do to change in order to let make them leave me alone? That's not going to happen. So he's clearly, the only way to do it is just tell him to leave me alone in general and just continue on continuing, which is absolutely bizarre. But I bring this up just to say is that it does look like for whatever reason nowadays um especially when it comes to content generation there is a lot of i think i think yeah i think fans have changed in their approach to things or people in general i think you have to be a somewhat okay person for people to quote unquote allow you to have a online career or something i think once people discover your reprehensible character they really do go out of their way to try and make sure that you get cancelled try and make sure that you don't have a career try and make sure that you don't have any recourse to come back and do the thing that you did to the level you did it before and i think even though people don't get punished in the way they probably should in terms of the justice system that's probably a decent way to kind of go about things where the community the fans themselves are the one to dictate the thing that i hate the most in terms of counterculture is when it's industries when it's um when it's um corporations that decide hey you don't have a career like when hollywood decides we're not gonna book you anymore because of this and this that's why i hate when people get blackballed by industry because i don't feel like that represents the fans i think if the fans are okay with um forgiving somebody that committed a really heinous crime however reprehensible it may be i think that person should be allowed to still have a career i don't think it should be up to the industry to basically tell us how to tell us what our morality and principles should be and i feel like nowadays the viewers and uh customers and the fans whatever you want to call them i feel like they're a little bit more intelligent they're a little bit more clued on they can figure out when something is generally bad they can maybe separate the artist from the art um they can maybe um make their own mind and decisions they don't need to be coaxed into deciding whether someone's a bad person or not. you're already seeing it now with this um andrew tate guy right he's getting banned on all these different platforms then people are just going and doing their own research they're finding clips of him saying stuff he sounds like a dickhead basically right he sounds like a bit of an oaf but essentially is he saying anything that should get him banned from every single social media platform that exists probably not is he saying things that you probably don't like to hear and maybe if you heard him speaking at a house party somewhere you'd probably leave his presence probably but does he deserve to go to jail get buried under a prison have his you know ability to basically have a presence on all the major social media platforms taken away from him just because he might have some racy opinions obviously not so people are now seeing that it's a bit dumb it's a bit weird how all these platforms are st which basically act like corporations right essentially coordinate these attacks because once one person once one platform takes you down they all go and notice and they decide hey we don't also stand for this so we're going to take you down too and make a stand and it just kind of feels a bit icky 
it feels like they're trying to tell us not to like people instead of us being able to make our own minds up about who we don't like and do like and for the most part these people are niche characters anyway who outside of people who sit on the internet even know who Andrew Tate is even people like DSP where these people are right we don't know who these guys are they only exist in a very small niche so when the people bring this much attention especially in these corporations get involved essentially you really do pump them up and make them even bigger than what they were prior and even though you take them off social media platforms they're earning potential outside of it especially nowadays that there's so many different platforms people have set up for like people who do get cancelled and stuff it just kind of makes them more successful and allows them to kind of ride that gravy train for even longer so it's a really bizarre tactic i wish we could just live in a world where you could just ignore things right um and just decide hey i don't like this we're gonna keep it moving the dsp example is probably not the best because you know you could just ignore dsp also but the fact that he's you know he does what he does it's just difficult to ignore it and just kind of turn the other cheese because he's essentially cultivated a cult around him and he essentially has in insulated himself for any criticism whatsoever so he can continue to do really reprehensible things online and get away with it for too long and people have just had enough that's fine but again it's mostly the community online because his fan base is really small you know even though his subs look amazing for the most part most of the subs have been botted you know people setting up ghost accounts to make his numbers look better and um, there's talk about him basically tipping himself under the monarchy at one minute man so he's not the best person to use as example but in general i just wish we would live in a world where people could just like let people be assholes on their own without the need of telling them that they can't be on the internet anymore because they're an asshole it just doesn't make any sense for me but again maybe i'm in the wrong maybe i don't know what i'm talking about i'd love to know what you guys think in the comments down below moving on from that i thought i would talk briefly about man united beating liverpool at home obviously with it being a derby it was an amazing result let's put that out there and not kind of you know um be too negative about it so definitely it being a derby with it coming the day with it coming with it being the game after the first two losses of the premier league against brighton and brentford it was obviously a very welcome result and performance i say even performance before the result i think if we, even if we drew this game i still think it would have been a great thing to kind of look back on uh, but i think any fan i think most fans with common sense no no i think most fans who are honest and most fans who are not blinkered i don't think we ever expected to see this level of performance or a uh, result from this team given how poorly we played against brighton and brentford because so, uh, you could easily say the brighton game we could were played off the park Brentford game maybe not so much but still Brentford probably could have scored more goals but we didn't deserve to win either of those matches and the fact that we were able to turn it around and perform to this level even against a weakened Liverpool side the Liverpool side is clearly lacking in some big names and missing big characters Darwin Nunes wasn't playing because of the suspension Thiago was um, injured I'm pretty sure so they're missing some key characters that they just lost Marnie haven't really replaced him too tough in terms of an out and out play that they can use there so there was a lot of things going wrong for them in that respect as well and they haven't started the season well either but the performance is very encouraging it clearly showed that these players do have it in them to work and to hustle and to run around um you saw a lot of players at the end of the game really out of their on their feet basically tired and knackered because they've had had to work this hard ever under any kind of managerial you know under any manager for a sustained period which is says a lot about the players to be honest but i would ear on the side of caution because i think the majority of these players are still the same bottle jobs that got into the position that we're in at the moment they're still the same players who essentially got loads of managers fired before ten Hag, and they're still the same players but for the most part have taken it for granted that they play for such a great club it's because they've basically been able because they basically have no accountability under the glazer ownership so that essentially has breeded a really toxic environment where the players are weirdly in control of such a great club and essentially take the piss out of the fans by putting in some really diabolical performances but this performance against liverpool let's be honest was decent it was pretty decent i thought the lineup was pretty solid and 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 and, and refreshing um eric ten Hag did end up dropping a few players off the back of that brentford game understandably because it was so poor but i don't think anyone expected him to draw harry Maguire. I think Harry Maguire being the captain and, you know, with Eric Ten Hag saying a lot of positive things about him and essentially saying, you know, he's the captain for me now. I'm not going to decide on anything as long as he plays well, he's going to play, whatever, right? But we just got the feeling that he was being overly protective of, of Harry Maguire and we didn't really think that he would get dropped because of the English bias and all this sort of nonsense that goes on around his name. But he obviously pulled up some pretty stinky performances and with the way that Maynard wants to play, he's probably not that well suited to Ten Hag's system anyway in general. So it's 
in regards of what he done prior to Ten Hag's appointment. Uh, Harry Maguire is probably unlucky because he's not the kind of profile defender that an Eric Ten Hag would like in the first place, which might kind of explain why he decided to go for Alessandro Martinez, which may be not true. He probably would have bought him anyway, but still, the 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 kind of um, the rush to kind of bring in a defender straight away. And if I remember correctly, during the summer transfer window, we were linked with Julian Timber, and I think he might have been the first player we were linked with. So clearly, there was a he identified the defense as definitely a weak point. Then he also dropped Luke Shaw, a player that I've been very much against having a United team for a very long time. I think his time has been and gone for a while, but as per usual, a lot of you English players that are associated with Man United, they just get to claim a paycheck and, you know, hang around forever and ever. We still have flipping Phil Jones at the club, for goodness sake. So I think the likes of Harry Maguire and Phil and Luke Jones, Luke, Harry Maguire and Luke Jones, Harry Maguire and Luke Shaw will be able to collect a check for much longer, but it was definitely refreshing to see them out of the team. And the difference that Lissandra Martinez and Malasia brought to the team the energy, the aggression, the tenacity was incredible in the back line. You could definitely see that they're a step above um, in quality with the likes of um, Maguire and Flippin' Shaw. Obviously, Martinez probably didn't replace Maguire. I think Varane did, and Varane played really well too. And if anything, they probably complement each other better, Varane and Martinez, because Martinez is very scrappy. He does like to get tight to, to, to attackers. He does like to slide. He does like to, he does like to basically have a bit of a battle and engage his defenders Oh, he saw the attackers, whereas you know, Varane is more in the Rio Ferdinand sort of mode. He's more classy. He likes to nip in and kind of take the ball away from the players and whatnot. So I do think that kind of helped. And of course, the midfield kind of worked as well. For Scott, Scott Matamane played pretty well. Ericsson did his job okay. Bruno Fernandes was running around a headless chicken, but he did pretty decent. And the rest was what it was, isn't it? The goal from Sancho was obviously very well taken. I loved seeing that. I thought Elanga played really well for the first 20 minutes or so. Rashford did okay. Not that amazing. But again, I think the team we were playing against was very weak and the team was playing against was very devoid of confidence and I think it was probably set up for us to kind of perform in this way and if anything the reason why I wouldn't get too giddy on it is because these players have been bottle jobs for a while they give us all this false hope and then they go and lose the next game to you know a pretty mediocre side so I'm not going to go too excited about this but it was a somewhat pleasing performance to see from our players so definitely pleased to see that going forward and of course all the flipping um all the salt from Jurgen Klopp at the end saying that, he, that his team deserved to win was also kind of nice to see. But apart from that, I wasn't that bothered about the game, to be honest, because I think the bigger picture is to get rid of the Glazers and the bigger picture is to kind of look at how we kind of try to evolve and develop over the next few years to kind of get us back to where we should be. But at the moment with the Glazer ownership, if we continue going the same way we are now, nothing's really going to change anyway. Um, and then to continue on with that, there's news, obviously, that Man United have signed Casemiro, the um, midfielder from Real Madrid, the one who's responsible for winning five uh, you know, Champions League titles at Real Madrid during his tenure there, right? A really classy, a really um, strong, a really aggressive, a really um, solid defensive midfielder. But again, he's coming from Real Madrid. He's coming from playing with two of the best midfielders in the world in Tony Cruz and Luka Modric and essentially being told to do one job and screen the back line while the two guys in front of him do all the magic. He can obviously contribute, but for the most part, he just screens the back line. So for him to come to go to that team to come into United midfield containing McTominay and Bruno Fernandes is going to be a completely different uh, kettle of fish so I'm not as excited as some people are out there about his signing of, and then the other thing to also keep in note is the fact that he's a 30 year old and we're essentially paying up to 70 million for him and we have by all accounts doubled his wages and the issue I would have with this is that Real Madrid is a team usually usually Real Madrid is a team when they let go of players, it's usually because they're on a decline. Think about the recent people they've let go, right? Like high profile players, um, like the likes of Isco. Um, who else? The likes of Ronaldo prior to that. Um, even Di Maria before he left there. Like they usually let go of players when they've kind of deduced that they've kind of squeezed as much juice out of them as possible. You rarely, if ever, you know, you're rarely going to see a scenario where a team's going to come in and buy Vinicius Jr. off of Real Madrid now unless they think internally that he's suffered too many injuries, that he's not as fast as he was before or something. But it's rare now that you're going to see them at this point in time let go of somebody like Vinicius Jr. It's not going to happen. So the fact that they let go of Casemiro because the deal was probably too good to turn down 
down because no one else in world football is ever going to offer Casemiro 70 million. No one's ever going to offer Madrid 70 million for Casemiro plus give him 300 grand a week. It's just not going to happen. So we're the only mugs that are going to do it because we're in dire straits. So does he improve this Man United team? Of course. Is he better than Scott McTominay? Of course. Is he better than Fred? Probably. Is he better than the majority of our midfield? Yes, of course. Especially when it comes to honours and trophies and mentality and the things he's won, blah, 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 blah. But in terms of where we want to go going forward, it just a, is a bit of a weird signing to make, especially to go from Adrian Rabio to Casemiro. It just means that we're kind of panicking now. There is no kind of sense in what we're doing. The Frankie Young deal was, to me, always a bit of a stretch goal. It wasn't something that was always kind of nailed on, even though Eric Ten Hag and Frankie De Jong have a prior relationship. I just felt, it, considering it's Barcelona, considering how difficult they are to deal with in the transfer market in general, considering what they're going through in terms of transfers and the stuff they're going through in the league in general, it just always seemed like, to me, a bit of a stretch. It never seemed something that was always going to be nailed on. So the fact that the club never really had other options that they were exploring at the same time and have kind of put all their baskets in the Frankie de Jong thing until the very last minute because it looks like we're not going to sign anybody else after we sign, you know, Casemiro. I think any fan out there who's legitimately thinking we're going to sign Casemiro and Frankie de Jong is probably smoking that good crack. But I just feel like it does smell of Glazers essentially trying to inoculate themselves from hate, trying to inoculate themselves from any sort of criticism from United um, fans by signing somebody who generally people feel like is a world-class player from a world-class team because generally for some fans out there who are quite simple-minded the fact that we're even in business with Real Madrid means that we're legit do you know what I mean it kind of gives them this false impression that we're back where we should be which obviously isn't the case so for me I feel like signing a 30-year-old Casemiro on 300 bags per week is definitely a move that I didn't want to see especially under girls ownership because it means that we're going to be you know left with a player who essentially is going to occupy the mod the um, What's his name? Uh, well, I forget his name for the Matic role. He's probably going to be a player that we're going to be struggling to get rid of later on down the line when his legs go and stuff. So it kind of puts us in another predicament that we probably don't need to put in again. But maybe you know the world market out there for defensive midfielders isn't what it is and maybe the club assessed that why would they, what would they rather do spend 50 million on some kid that's unproven who's 20 or spend 60 million on somebody who's proven and can get the job done within the next two or three years and so, and basically ensure that we you know qualify for Champions League football this season next season and the season after that I don't really know but either way um, I'm not that enthusiastic about it obviously in terms of football in terms of what we're going to watch on the pitch it's going to be better to see a better player playing but again I think him coming into this team him coming into the Premier League is no um, confirmation there's no guarantee he's going to hit the floor running the Premier League is a completely different kettle of fish especially this season it seems like the teams outside of the top four are really going for it they're going to be taking a lot of points off of the quote the, the you know quote unquote top four sides um, I have a feeling we're going to find we're going to have a very weird winner of the league this season so don't be surprised if Tottenham end up winning the league or something mad like that it's going to be a very topsy-turvy season and the Premier League generally is one of the toughest leagues in the world anyway so it's not going to be easy for somebody who plays for one of the best teams in the world the guy that turned you know Roman you turn up to Celta Vigo and they essentially just lie down right I go to Ibar and they lie down but there is no such such thing in the English Premier League every every week there's no lie down games even in the Carabao Cup the teams really go for it so I'm not really that infused about the signing I would have preferred to have seen someone younger I would have preferred to have seen maybe more people come in more bodies for that kind of money but you know the club's going to do what the club's going to do and again until the Glazers go all this stuff is mute anyway it's just them papering over the claps and it papering over the gaps it's just them putting a bandage on a gun wound essentially but they still need to go they still need to go so Glazers out forever um, until they leave and all these signings just on you know are just things to appease fans on social media anyway moving on this is courtesy of Hype Beast. This is a interesting article about a really weird and dumb feature that I don't understand why they're testing it because I would I would have preferred you know something different. But hey, so it says here the headline: Instagram is internally testing a feature called Candid Challenges. What is Candid Challenges? You say. I'll tell you. So Candy Challenges appears to look a lot like the photo sharing app Be Real, which I've never used before myself. The social media presents um, users with a daily notification at a random time throughout the day. Challenge them to immediately share a photo of themselves and their surroundings within a two minute window. While the France based app was launched in 2020, it became popular with Generation Z around mid 2022. So that might explain why I don't know it because I'm not Generation Z. So this crazy, dumb, weird shitty feature that they're using essentially again taken away from um 
the general use I think of Instagram should be pictures, but again, they kind of generally move away to that, moving more to kind of video content. And it says as follows: screenshots posted by Palsy show that Candy Challenges will ask Instagram users to capture and share photo with uh, two minutes at a t- different time. Okay, it's a photo, not video. Okay, I take that back. They can also add candies to others um, to their story tray. So obviously you see it there, can vid, okay, not now. According to policy, users will only be able to use the dual camera located on the back of the phone to take the candy, so no selfies. An Instagram post when confirmed and engaged the features the internal prototype is currently not testing internally, meaning that no users have access to candy just yet. So this is maybe a decent thing because it means that they go back to the photo sharing side of things, but I would still like to see Instagram concentrate more on photo sharing because it feels like nowadays the app is essentially turned into an adult version of TikTok. That's essentially what it is. I spend most of my time looking at memes or looking at videos which are basically memes, right? I don't necessarily look at beautiful pictures anymore at all. Even though there are some friends of mine who do upload some, you know, really lovely vacation videos and whatnot. There's a lot of vacation sorry pictures. I've seen a lot more people on my feed going to places in Italy, going to Ibiza and whatnot. So that's been nice to see kind of live fry courtesy through their holiday snaps but for the most part it's all video all video and it's really really annoying i have to be honest um and this is another kind of thing that we're going to see going forward so maybe instagram is deciding hey we're going to bank on gen z because they're the ones who are essentially the youngest on our platform that we can kind of promote and market to and we're going to need them for the next 20 30 years anyway so let's fuck everybody else off and just give them what they want and maybe it'll work maybe it won't but for me i'm just not infused by it i would like to see a little bit more owners put back onto the photo sharing side of things at least so we have one flipping social media app out there that is more predominantly about photos why can't we have one I know someone else can start something, but essentially Instagram, the whole point of it was the photos, right? It was the filters and whatnot and the captions you were going to write underneath them. It was never about video. Video was like an afterthought, but now it's become the number one thing. I know for me, my usage of Instagram, I'm only using it to you know post stories and stuff. And most of my stories are just essentially memes or videos I've checked off the internet. So it's really changed the way that I use the platform, which is, um, which is you know, unfortunate, but it is what it is. Let's move on from that one. Next, we have news courtesy from Hypebeast regarding Kanye West. It seems like he's filed a new trademark for a new clothing brand or maybe just a, um, what would you call it? Uh, a platform that he can present ideas on because I'm sure it's not going to be just a clothing brand. You know, Kanye is never going to do things that are just, you know, binary and simple. He's always going to do things that are a little bit more mind expanding, a little bit more interesting. But courtesy of Hype, says as follows. It says, Kanye West has filed a US federal trademark application for a new logo under his Mascot Holdings Inc. company, according to attorney Joss Gerbin. And this is a tweet. It says, Kanye West has filed a new trademark application out of the logo below. The logo appears to be a blue circle with flute exterior lines kind of looks like the um, kind of looks like a wrapper from Muffet or something the filing claims that Kanye will offer clothing footwear and accessories in connection with this logo so there's no name for the actual thing but there is a um, there is a name for the owner which is I guess Kanye's holding company's mascot mascote holdings mascotti or something um, it's got here clothing underwear jackets pajamas and footwear in terms of what it's going to be doing and then it's got another thing retail store services featuring clothing footwear and accessories so that's the only details we've got and it continues here it says yeah submitted a slew of trademark applications this year in June the multi-hyphenate made 17 filings indicating his intent to create users branded amusement parks blockchain product blocked blockchain sorry backed currencies non-fungible tokens um physical and online retail spaces toys games sporting equipment campaign buttons clothing bags and household items during an interview with Cannes premiere in 2012 short film crew summers year revealed that he was interested in one day creating his own amusement parks so clearly it feels like to me with the success of Yeezy with the success of Yeezy Supply with the success of Kanye West.com with the success of his merch his activations the work he's doing at Adidas it feels like Kanye has finally gotten the hang of things when it comes to production and manufacturing that's usually the one thing you'd always hear him moaning about right production and manufacturers i can't get things made to a high level i need things done to a um stella mccartney you know chanel carl lagerford whatever 
flipping thing he would be using as a sample level and at the time we didn't really understand it then when he started to make things on his own and it didn't really go too well with his own fashion line and he saw the kind of difference that he made in terms of going from his own fashion lines in the first couple of scenes of Jesus to when it got back to Adidas properly you then saw the kind of uptake in the quality and the range and whatnot the pricing kind of changed also and I think people started to slowly understand why he was so persistent and so kind of forthright in his appeal to make sure he had people backing him and he was a welcoming with open arms into the industry so he could have use of all those resources and manufacturing opportunities and whatnot and it feels like maybe now he's finally got his feet under the table he's now a legit billionaire all those avenues of business that he's doing are going really really well to the point where he's you know advising others on how to set up businesses and whatnot and now even Sunday services become its own kind of living thing that doesn't even need him to be there anymore he's just kind of become a little bit of a machine in terms of getting ideas out so it's no surprise that he would want to kind of do something else and kind of brand brand branch out from the easy thing and just trick here keep creating that way too because i thought for myself like a long time ago for one of the saddest things about virgil Abloh passing was that i always thought that i always felt that there was um slow in there was small indications that he was trying to pull away from the off-white louis vuitton thing anyway and create something else i don't know what that would have been i don't know if it would have been something under canary yellow i don't know if it would have been something under his kind of moniker he's using that vaaa thing i'd always got the feeling that he was trying to pivot away from them things to do to have something else that he could maybe just have free reign on and really go crazy because i'd imagine when you're a creative at that sort of level um there does become there does it does put kind of limitations of what you can do right because you have backers you have people you kind of have to report to so the fun that you were kind of having before isn't the same so i'd imagine that might be the same with a person like a kanye you can't essentially do the stuff you want to do on yeezy anymore because the yeezy brand is so intrinsically tied to you or tied to a particular kind of image or whatever it may be or vibe so maybe you need something else fresh to kind of present some other fresh ideas on and kind of you know make an impact that way so i'm eager to see what's going to be presented through this new um trademark hopefully it's something interesting hopefully it's something fresh and new and it'll be cool just to see him evolve and develop and be able to offer something different because i think that's the real marker of creative is one thing to be able to kind of have very one very honed voice but being able to start again and launch another one that has another thing is incredible i think that maybe makes me think of why i kind of fell in love with the kind of japanese side of things the tokyo side when it comes to people like hiroshi fujiwara nigo john takahashi from undercover a lot of those guys when they first started would have would, would start like underground sort of like brands that they would kind of only run for a few years and they'll close them down never to repeat them again and then start a new one and i remember they interviewed hiroshi one time and they asked him and he's got so many brands that he did in the past um, you know i can't even name them all but so many that he did prior to kind of you know doing fragment and taking that way where it's kind of been at the moment and he was like oh he just likes to do things and just like to start again and try some new things and it's pretty cool because most of those brands for the most part would have different kind of tones and feels to their lookbooks the branding will be different there'll be nothing discernible or nothing similar about the brands that he did before and what he did now you know the only thing that's the same is just the person that's behind it but i do think that's a real mark of a creative to be able to kind of start one you know kind of like brand inspired by 90 skateboarding in the new york or something and then start another brand that's inspired by flipping surf culture in the 80s or 70s and shit completely different vibes completely different demographic um different completely different codes like all that stuff is incredible to watch as a fan from out from afar um uh, you know to kind of spot all that stuff and see it kind of progressing and going forward and again for someone like kanye i'm really curious to see how that kind of evolves because we're so used to seeing that kind of dystopian earthy toned yeezy vibe right kind of stripped back stripped bare sort of vibe so it'd be cool to see what he would do under this new moniker if it'd be another sort of vibe so let's see wagwan let's see wagwan next we have this this is kind of a bit of a stretch because the shoes are a bit shit but this is courtesy of hype pizza says adidas celebrates Notting hill carnival with the festive samba and canvas releases when it comes to adidas i wonder but usually when it comes to um what is it when it comes to their, uh, what do you call it? Uh, their tone of voice or whatnot. Sometimes when you see A that's written in a sentence, it's usually with a lowercase a. But then sometimes when it's in a sentence, it has an uppercase a. I wonder if it's like, if A that's is at the start of the sentence, it has to be uppercase. And if it's in the middle of a sentence, it has to be lowercase. Because it kind of, I think generally looks better in lowercase like that, in my opinion. 
as a word, right? It looks far better, I think, like that than it does with the uppercase. But maybe I'm just bugging. Anyway, let's continue. It says here, hey, they celebrate Notting Hill Carnival with the festive Samba and Camus releases, right? So they're obviously trying to connect Notting Hill Carnival with Ada Sambas, which I don't know, especially when you consider Adidas's root, you know, Adidas's roots and what it was founded, to have it being so closely associated with a um, very predominantly black music festival is a little bit funny, a little bit wild, a little bit interesting. But again, who am I to speak about these things? I don't know nothing. And the shoes aren't that great anyway. They've got a couple of birds on them. And this one's, what has it got? The, the campus has what? a bird's wing on the inside like just terrible waste of fabric no one's gonna buy them they're gonna end up in a cell rack so no one gives a shit but it made me think in general about carnival and what the vibe is because i'm on social media a lot i'm following i think the right accounts to get a vibe of things i'm around young people even though i'm not young myself and i kind of see what's going on and is it me or is it feel like no one's really talking about it too tough it feels like it's kind of people have kind of obviously quietly decided if they're going to go or not, but the hype around it isn't what it maybe was in the past. I don't know if it's because of all the years that it's been postponed due to COVID. I don't know if it's because um, Gen Z in general seem to be a little bit lackadaisical when it comes to their enthusiasm for things. They don't really seem to get excited for things, these kids. They just seem to kind of be a little bit laissez-faire, which is, again, maybe a consequence of the society they live in in general. But it does seem to be a lot of like, there's, there's, there's not a lot of noise around it. And this is the first kind of, I think, in what, two years, maybe two and a half, maybe three, right? It's been a long time. And usually, if you're not from London, then you wouldn't know. But not in your carnival is like legitimately one of the major events to go to in the kind of summer wind, in the summer calendar, right? Next to kind of Wimbledon and shit and all this other stuff, like in festivals. Like, not in your carnival is definitely one of the things to go to because it's the only large scale kind of street festival where you get to eat, drink, do drugs, and wind up on random women in london right and without having the threat of being arrested and shit especially if you if you're a gentleman you probably get, get more results but in general it's definitely a one-of-a-kind situation especially in a country like ours where we're essentially anti-fun and it go out of their way to make sure that we don't have any kind of adult fun in general and stop any kind of freedom of expression joy dancing and just anything else connected to that so the fact that people are generally kind of being a little bit meh about carnival is very odd and very strange now i don't know if this is the calm before the storm and more likely than not everyone's going to be flooding the streets when it does happen fair enough but for now i've not really heard of anything i've seen some people sharing clips of people in terms of telling them how to behave and code of conduct in terms of whining which is absolutely insane because for the most part whining is very cutthroat very black and white you try to grind up against somebody they wind for you with them for like a couple of seconds they turn around and they decide whether it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down and usually it's very public and it's very obvious that you got a thumbs down so it's not as if like you can go there and kind of grab somebody by the neck and force them to wind with you because everyone will see and you'll probably get tumped out so it kind of does separate the men from the boys that situation generally because not everyone has a guts to even go behind somebody with a massive derriere and attempt to dance with them regardless of how scantily clad they are so all those code of conduct things i thought was a waste of time because the the, the whole act of trying to get someone to wind with you is incredibly nerve-wracking anyway so it's like you're speaking to a real small percentage of men out there but regardless anyway that's the only thing i've seen i've only seen those things i've not seen anything else concerning kind of what at all but one thing i have seen which i thought was very interesting was i saw a fly going around regarding a supposed ama piano set that's going to be happening or stage that's going to be happening at carnival which I don't really understand or get personally for me because the whole point of Carnival is that it is meant to be more focused on Caribbean culture and Caribbean music, which is essentially bashment, soca, reggae, all those kind of things, right? And for whatever reason, I felt like the introduction or the shoehorning of African music, it just feels a little bit try hard and a little bit extra. I would much prefer it if we had the ability to have a separate carnival thing that maybe catered to more African music, that would be pretty decent. But again, this is London, this is the UK, that's never going to happen. They gave us carnival and that's it, right? We're not going to get anything else. But I thought the news here, as you can see, courtesy of my screen, if I can get it up here, 
oh man why does it always do this anyway it doesn't matter but i'm going to get up here on my screen now but as you can see from my screen this news regarding um the ammo piano set happening at carnival is just a bit odd to me and it feels like a little bit try hard a little bit more shoehorny i don't really get it so it says here no no carnival will have the first ever ammo piano stage for 2022 it says no no carnival has the first stage the new year Land stage will bring together the pioneers of ammo piano from south africa and up becoming london artists to bring the sound of the streets of not here will take over the sunday stage on the 28th from 12 to 7 at the Hazelwood Crescent. Those who visit Sound System and Stage will be fined special Hennessy bar, selling drinks and food from Jollof Mama. So they're clearly going for it. They've got Hennessy sponsoring it, which is pretty wild considering the history Hennessy have with being a little bit hesitant to sponsor or market, you know, or, you know, align themselves with black creators and black artists and stuff. So that's cool to see. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a little bit forced. I think it's a little bit extra. I would prefer an, uh, our own dedicated African sort of carnival in some way, shape or form or festival. And I feel like in general, not your carnival's history is always kind of steeped in, you know, Caribbean music, like I said before. And I don't necessarily think you need to muddy it by including stuff like my piano and stuff. It just doesn't make any sense for me personally. I don't see any real correlation between the music at all, apart from the people that make it maybe look the same. But apart from that, there's nothing that kind of correlates to it at all in the slightest i think even back in the day when afro beats was maybe played a lot in carnival i always thought that was a stretch but at least afro beats is maybe a little bit similar ish to some bashment tunes or reggae tunes or whatnot but i'm a piano is in a completely different you know bpm scale you know completely different sound completely different everything about it so it feels a little bit forced to me in my opinion but maybe it's a good thing you know in terms of bringing people together and whatnot but i would prefer in an ideal world that we have had our own festival that we could kind of play that music in because imagine the amount of genres that you could put for a you know a kind of um african-centric sort of festival imagine the kind of musical genres that you could include in it it would be absolutely crazy absolutely nuts the amount of stage and sound systems that you could have with different types of music from different parts of south africa sorry different parts of africa in general would be absolutely incredible but again you know the fact that we have carnival anyway still to this day is a miracle so for me to demand another festival where they allow black people to be ourselves and unapologetically is really really a stretch that's not going to happen it? not in the slightest no way jose so um yeah i guess i'm a piano people will be happy about that but i'm curious to see how the reception will be i guess it'll be good anyway because we haven't had carnival in ages people are going to be excited to have anything do you know what i mean they're not going to be that bothered about it to be honest so i'm sure i'm only the i'm the only person who's maybe reacting a little bit negatively to this sort of news i'm sure most people won't really care and they'll be over the moon that it's happening in the first place because guess what they haven't had a chance to you know enjoy this for a long time so the fact that it's happening in the first place is probably a good thing anyway going forward so let's see what happens when it does happen let's see what happens when it does happen next on the list we have this quick news i went to check and note to you because i thought these looked really really tasty this is courtesy of hypeys and says pharrell was spotted in a new adidas nmd s1 silhouette and I'm liking it because, you know, the NMDs are a model that I've always kind of liked. Um, I think I've had the first, first ever ones that came out that kind of look like black apple with sort of like the France colors on the side in terms of the bubbles or little things that stick out of them. So I've always been a fan to keep an eye on them, but the models kind of died over the last few years, it felt like. But whatever this model of S NMD is, I'm a fan of it. And it's got um, human race kind of written on the side, you know, um, Pharrell's brand that he has going on. So it's courtesy of Hypebeast. The text is as follows. So it says, um, new innovations from Ada, sorry, tend to attract more attention from the seeker community nowadays, especially when it comes to the brand's lifestyle category. One series that's gradually broadened this uh, put has been the NMD S1, and it looks like um, another variant is in the works as Pharrell has recently spotted rocking up and coming model at the Billionaire Boys Club New York Yankees launch. Based on its early look, it appears that the original shape is being retained, but the upper is being designed in a more sleek aesthetic, knitted uppers that are bereft of any of the street stripe free stripes sorry branding on the quarter panels instead they come in better with an oversized human race lettering that spans nearly the entirety of the lateral wall the the particular iteration um comes fitted with a lighter beige knitted uppers and laces and comes contrasted with a bold blue hue now the reason why i like these could be the fact that they look kind of like 350s right they kind of look they kind of got a bit of a yeezy vibe to them but i do like they have this kind of chunkier 
kind of feel, especially towards the outside of them. They've got that kind of spiked, grittier outsole. Um, the top of the shoe doesn't look a little bit as pointy as a Yeezy. Cause that's the one thing I don't really like about 350s. Why they wouldn't suit my feet because they're a bit too pointy and make my feet look way more longer than they probably should be. But I do like the overall silhouette and shape of them. And obviously, you know, Pharrell is obviously swagging them out spectacularly well here and there's a full length picture here that I kind of jacked from who is Celebrity Vice of Pharrell actually head to toe in navy with a you know old school billionaire boys club shirt on and he makes them look really good in this outfit right they look absolutely hard right he's got the handlebar moustache going on he's got the I don't know what the hat is human I think human made um, snap back on and he's wearing the Adidas and they look really really well good in this flipping outfit so I'm really a big fan of these I'm not sure when they're going to end up coming out but when they do end up coming out I'm definitely going to make sure I throw my hat in the ring because I definitely do like the shape of them overall so but in general for us done some really good stuff with Adidas anyway even those really Really kind of box standard were they Stan Smiths or kind of shoes they did in different colours and stuff like bold kind of like contrasting colours they were really nice as well so he generally has done good stuff with Adidas and I'm eager to see what these end up looking like when they finally do come out I really am okay continuing on we have some more news courtesy of Supreme and this is now considering their new shoes that are generally meant to be coming out soon which I'm assuming is a Nike SB Blazer this could be the ones that we saw recently which were kind of um a redo of the earlier models that they had before that I had which were the quilted Blazer SBs that had a sort of Gucci kind of um print towards the back of the heel which I generally end up selling I had two pairs of the black and the red colorway which I really regret selling them at the time but it seems that they're going to be um redoing them in a sort of updated model I'm not sure so if this is the actual model itself but this is a video courtesy of Supreme or courtesy of Supreme drops that they obviously Supreme made and it's called Brooklyn 2022 and hopefully and, and this actually does feature the supreme uh, blazers that are meant to be coming out soon they look pretty pretty decent and blazers are not really the model that i'm always super fond of but i feel like they're a model that if they're done in the right colorways then they're definitely something that you could definitely i could definitely see myself in i think back to a particular model that i've always kind of had my eye on which is the poets blazer sb i'm not sure, sure if you guys remember that one i think it was gino in in uacho in which i you pronounce his name um blazer that he did back in the day but i remember that being one of my favorite blazers that i really liked where is it there we go was it was it poetry it was poetry yeah, that one was the navy one this blue one i thought this one always looked really lovely this came out a while ago and yeah it's poets lighthouse yeah this is really fucking lovely was it gino and you actually i think it's gino who does his brand i'm not too sure i forgot which one it is but anyway regardless it's like a navy upper with like perforated upper with suede with navy suede swoosh white laces with a white foxing and a navy navy midsole and outsole so pretty much navy all the way with some white in it you can't go wrong with that color combo is similar to like black and white it always works and that i thought was a really really hard and sick model um but yeah so i've always kind of had my eye on blazer sbs but again like i said they're not always the thing that really suits my shape of foot and so whatnot and my overall style but i thought these ones are really really tough and let's see what these uh blazer sb ones look like from this brooklyn video so you can get a different vibe of them i might have to mute the music because i'm sure the music's going to be um something that's going to be legit that i'm probably not going to be able to get not copy strike on in here. Let's play anyway. S U P R E M E. music up actually let's look at the sbs themselves the blazers you see regular skaters doing their tricks and hanging around doing their thing he looks like it's got a bit of a design on the back of the heel there if i'm not mistaken i see a little design there some sort of print let's go forward a little bit more there's a guy wearing the heavenly shirt the heavenly polo is flipping lovely in it from this season for winter coming up it's really fucking nice man it's good i think that's going to be a piece a lot of people are going to be end up buying and wearing a lot i'm sure it's going to resell for crazy amounts too but it's definitely i've seen i'll see a lot of people wearing that i think day to day especially in festivals because it seems to be the quote-unquote attire of dudes when they go festivals like a loud shirt and shorts and trainers and shit it's crazy how many people you see wearing the same outfit like vintage kind of fucked up shirts or hawaiian shirts or something with naruto or anime on it some jean shorts and some trainers it's like a standard festival attire so i think that'll do well but in general the blazers look pretty sick from what i can see here not real detail we can see too tough there's a black pair here that he's wearing they look like a complete all blacked out pair that i'm definitely going to be interested in because you know i mean all black shoes let's fast forward this a little bit more 
Got the guy wearing that pretty sick um, jersey, whatever that is, with all the dates on it and stuff. Maybe it's the dates of the collab. Oh, yeah, that's in the Four Winner, four in the, sorry, 22 Collection 2. I forgot. Um, but yeah, not many details here. We've got a navy pair also that looks similar to the Poets one with a white outsole. Again, you can see the swoosh there. It may look, does it look like snake skin to you? It looks like it's been, it's got some sort of pattern on the swoosh. It's like a white outsole, so a white midsole and white outsole. You've got a navy blue upper with like a brownish, snakeish looking swoosh. So that may be similar to what I've seen beforehand. Continue on a bit more on this video here. Scrub a little bit more. And you see another kid wearing a black pair with that kind of snaky print on the swoosh. So they look pretty hard. I'm not gonna be honest. I'm not gonna lie. So I'm assuming they're gonna have a navy, they're gonna have a black pair with this with the with the snake swoosh, they're gonna have an all black pair with the snaky print on it, but it's gonna be black as well. So maybe four or five colours I'm seeing already that are gonna be in the collection. But yeah, Supreme always do really cool videos that give you a vibe of New York and America in general and what they're about and their crew and whatnot. You know what I mean? The feel, the tone of it is always really good. It's a guy, I forgot how you pronounce his surname, William something, that always produces and directs the videos and stuff. They always seem to have a good handle on who the coolest, hippest looking kids are to use in their videos also, so that always helps as well. But yeah, these SBs look pretty decent, pretty sick. I can't really get an, a real good look at what they're going to end up looking like, but I'm eager to see what they do end up looking like when they finally do come out because, like I said, Blazers are a really underrated model in general. They don't really get as much love as they probably should do. Um, oh yeah, look, they've got the little, um, see, they've got the little uh, ring, the little D-ring at the back that I had on my um, quilted SBs from back in the day. So they might actually be quilted. They don't look it from the picture or from this, but they might be quilted actually. So that's pretty sick. I'm going to actually screenshot that for later. But that's pretty sick. I, I'm not, I, I, I don't mind that to be honest. I don't mind that. So yeah, let's look out for those when they do end up finally coming out. Let's look out for those. Next on the list here, we have this pretty sick thread uh, that I kind of stumbled across on on Twitter actually, courtesy of a Twitter account called Mitch underscore Kanaka. And it's essentially an entire thread of the history of Supreme. And I really recommend you check it out if you're not that clued up about Supreme and stuff and want to find out more about the brand and you don't want to read many interviews or go through tons of articles. I really recommend checking out this thread and skimming across it and kind of getting some of the main parts of it. And I'm quickly going to read a couple of bits of it here. It says Supreme is now valued at $2.1 billion um, dollars and their products resell at 1,200% profit, right, price. But it only costs 12 k to open its first store. This is a crazy story of how Supreme created this cult-like brand. And you've got a picture here of James Jebbia standing out of the original Supreme store and another Supreme store here. I think that's a fake one in China somewhere. It continues. It says Supreme is focused on two things, limited edition drops, exclusivity, and strong community. Yeah, right, but many businesses got good communities and limited offers so what's the deal here let's get started he said okay it started with a boy named james jebbia he was 15 when he was in the played in a british series called grain chill which is obviously something that a lot of people if you're down you would know called tommy watson 1978 20 years later he was going to hit 800 million net worth he's worth 800 million oh fucking hell James moved to NYC in the 1980s. Um, he found a job in Manhattan-based clothing store, Parachute. The job was nice, but he wanted something of his own, so he opened up Union NYC on 172 Spring Street in 1989. If I'm not mistaken, Union he opened up with his wife, I'm sure, at the time. Or am I not mistaken with his partner? And then when he decided to take Supreme full-time, I think Chris Gibbs was working there already, and that's when he took over the reins. I'm pretty sure that's how it worked out. And then there's the other story about Undefeated, isn't it, right? Like, I think Undefeated was a name that, um, that um, what's his name, Aaron Bondaroff made up and then he swapped Undefeated for a New York thing that the guy called James Bond, I think, who founded the Undefeated kind of had. So it's, there's some weird law around New York brands. I wish I remembered all of it, but there's some weird law around that whole retail mafia group, whatever. But it's very, very deep and very long lasting. A lot of connections there. And a lot of people that sprung up from the union have done crazy different things in the industry as well. So it's really far reaching the influence of Supreme Union and all that stuff. It continues. It says union was his first step in into what's known as streetwear. In 1991, James helped uh, established um, Stussy NYC soon Stussy was a surfer and he's called the father of streetwear who started out by painting surfboards so the connection there is deep again another story the legendary brand that's still going strong this day even though Sean Stussy is not involved in it at all it says um, while still working at Stussy James Jebbia launched Supreme 
Men, oh, so he was working as Sup Stuchy at the time. Okay, I thought it was Union. Okay, fair enough. Many say that Supreme wouldn't have emerged if it had not been for Sean Stuchy around it. The first Supreme store was open on Lafayette Street. The year was 1994 and the place looked like this. It's mad to actually go there. When you first, I remember when I first went there and like, what did I go there? The first and only time I went there was when I first went to New York City was, when was it? Was it 2008 or something like that? Or 2010? Long time ago, right? And one of the main things that you get from it when you go in there, especially being a hardcore Supreme fan and a hardcore Supreme Shooter fan, it does kind of feel like you're going on a bit of a pilgrimage. It feels kind of eerie because you've watched and kind of observed and loved the store from afar for so, so long. So long, right? Um, to the point where you're fantasizing about going there for ages, right? You'll see it in magazines, you see it in flipping um, magazine scans online, you see it in random videos and whatnot. You'd get second hand accounts from people on forums, and then when you finally go there, it's like, whoa. And the first thing I remember being struck with when I went there was how loud the music was. I don't know if it's the same nowadays, but that Lafayette store, the music was absolutely blaring from that store like literally like nightclub music like nightclub level of loudness i was like whoa because you're not used to that of course and it wasn't like you know i'm used to working in retail stores where essentially they ban you from playing anything decent that you listen to yourself and your own ipod or whatnot so you end up just having to play vanilla basic ass radio hits and whatnot but they were playing like you know really aggressive hip-hop really amazing metal like super super loud that's one thing i remember just getting caught off guard with and of course the sales assistants were fucking rude as hell they kind of did, they definitely did live up to the archetype of their store systems just being dickheads and kind of vibing you out and making you essentially beg and plead them for the ability to you know for, for the privilege of them going to the back and getting you a t-shirt and whatnot it was absolutely nuts but i loved it all i mean i love being talking i love being treated like shit in there because i came back again i think the time we went there it was on sale too so we were able to grab some bargains and i was back in the day when the dollar was you know really cheap compared to the pound so you could get a lot more stuff for the for your for your money nowadays you're essentially paying the same price you would in dollars and pounds anyway so it's no real difference um the conversion rate's a bit shit but yeah that's the first thing i remember going up to straight away like and it was obviously far bigger than what it looked like on the magazine too that's what i remember too it was a lot bigger it continues it says the store you can see the picture above got closed in 2019 tw 25 years after the brand launching yeah so it's not there anymore so that's mad but that was the heart of what you would, could say about streetwear it was just not a clothing store it was also a hub for the regional streetwear community for sure that's what i remember as well you could definitely you definitely knew you were coming around supreme because the first thing you could hear was wheels slapping on the floor like people skateboarding straight away you could hear wheels slapping da, da. The sound of skateboards you know, rolling across the flipping concrete and the pavements and stuff, so it was pretty sick. And the first Supreme store um, stormed the neighborhood. Skaters came not only to buy something but to also meet with another. It was important because there was only one such place at the time called Keith Herring's Pop Shop between Lafayette and Corsby. But Pop Shop was different. It was a kind of range merged between um, art pieces and a spot for hippies, and it didn't have the underground atmosphere. So Jebia had his niche. He gave his target more, much more than new clothing he contributed to the underground culture his growth was just obvious um what's more james was a clever entrepreneur he had he had a great growth strategy supreme underproduced in other words shortage in clothing equals growth in the growing demand seth Godin analyzed the case of supreme's marketing in a nutshell he said it was as follows the scarcity effect the premium look and the skillful guessing of people's desires although supreme could sell more they produce less it made their products scarce and unique and they also target a bit richer custom, customer sorry they knew that their customer wanted to raise their social status looking good and um premium I'm sure he does a job and that's the thing that I remember back in the day now it's not so much because I think it's more lame and probably a little bit cringe and a little bit you know um people just used to seeing the logo too much but i remember back in the day when it was actually hard to find people wearing supreme and it was legitimately like if you saw if you saw someone wearing supreme it was equivalent to me going to a foreign country somewhere in the middle of central europe and seeing another black guy and be like whoa and you know you give each other that little nod of like yeah respect so the same with supreme you'd be like wow you saw another kid wearing supreme top especially if it was something that was like from yesteryear or just came out recently like how did they get hold of it because you can't buy it online you can't buy it here you have to get shipped over Jeremy, it was a bit of a hard 
hard thing to kind of get. So when you saw someone with it, it definitely did increase your when you felt, sorry when you wore it yourself, it definitely did cre- increase your social status. You definitely felt way cooler. Nowadays, I don't think kids actually legitimately care. It doesn't actually do anything. If anything, it probably makes you look more lame. But back then, a box logo, a Supreme piece, anywhere in general, doesn't matter if it's got a box logo on it or not. If someone could guess it was Supreme, they would definitely consider you to be a cooler person just because of the clothes you wore. But I'd also say back then, also to be fair to us, we were also far more interesting as well because, you know, we didn't have the access that people have nowadays. So if you were buying that kind of stuff, you you kind of wanted to walk the walk. So you'd listen to the, you know, quote unquote, right music. You'd write, watch the right films. You'd read the right books. You'd try to expose yourself to as much as that kind of overall world as possible so that you were kind of all encompassing cool and not just like cool with the t-shirt and the hat. You know I mean, you didn't want to be service level cool. Where now these kids, I feel like are way more okay with just being like surface level cool, like just having a look, wearing the pearl earrings, painting the nails, um, having the kind of punk aesthetic, but not having any punk music in their flipping, you know, iTunes or Serato or Spotify not really watching anything kind of counterculture or edgy just watching all normie basic bitch sort of stuff and not really kind of ingratiating themselves in the look that they're kind of ascribing to that's the only thing I'd say there's a bit of a malaise with this generation I don't know what it is really because you know with the access you would imagine you'd want to soak yourself in a little bit more but they seem hesitant to do it they just want to put on a uniform feel cool make TikTok videos and keep it moving which is you know disappointing but it is what it is I guess everyone's got their faults so it continues says here but that's not all as part of the sex guessage strategy they introduced drops the drops appeared on Thursdays and Saturdays in Japan to avoid queues a number of people were invited to join the drops so yeah back in the day that you'd uh, queue outside and sleep outside this has obviously changed completely now there was a rule though one uh, one item only per cut uh, only one item per customer um so some people went with their friends to get styles that's back in the day when people used to bring their mums and that to the queues i can't there was in my whole time queuing i never once saw a black mum in the queue queuing for some kid to buy flipping trainers or clothes never in the history of me queuing never did i ever see a black mum which made a lot of sense imagine trying to ask a black mum to take to go with you to flip in central london to stand outside of a shop for five plus hours to have the opportunity and a chance to buy a pair of sneakers or clothing that you might be able to resell later on a chance not a, not a guarantee or certainty a chance and sometimes in some stores i remember i won't name them some stores wouldn't even sell to your mum because they'll be like no nah, she's not gonna wear it we know you're just bringing her to get an extra one for yourself. So they wouldn't sell to them. Some stores would be that petty. They wouldn't even sell to your mum if she queued up for six hours. They'd be like, nah, she's not going to wear it. You're just bringing her here to get an extra one for yourself. So like, can you imagine your mum, your African mum putting up that or a black mum in general? It's not going to happen. So um, that was always funny to see these kind of essentially privileged white kids who had mums who were around and not working who were able to come to drops at 9 a.m. in the morning and just hang around and stuff and, you know, try to get an extra jumper or hoodie for their kid and shit. It continues to say there's also some mystery about the web next Supreme drop is going to take place. Only a few people are informed about it. Of course, today you can get news faster. Exactly. Back in the day, we didn't have any of this stuff. We didn't have the excellent account that I follow on Twitter, Supreme Drops. It didn't exist. You'd have to guess what was in there. People would have to go to the store and report back to the forums and say what they saw. You couldn't take pictures inside the store. It was really hard to get the shit. Nowadays, people have PDFs. They have flipping um, line sheets of the stuff that are going to be in there. They know exactly what items are going to be there. They, can, they know the prices it's eerie it's scary how different it is nowadays but anyway i'm not gonna read the entire thing check it out yourself i'll put a link in the in the clip note in the clip actually description i'll put the link in there also in the podcast link in the podcast um description i also put the link so you can check it out yourself but it's really really interesting recommend you check it out uh if read by mitch or m-i-c-h underscore kanaka k-a-n-k-a i'm um, talking about supreme a history of it so definitely check it out if you haven't definitely check it out if you haven't Next one is I thought was interesting here. This is Curse of the Street Wear Night Live. And these are essentially a pair of Adidas's, right? And the Adidas model is called, actually, let me get up on the screen, sorry. The model itself is this courtesy of Street Night Live or Street Wear Night Live, sorry, right? This nice model. And it's actually this model that I saw while back but i didn't notice that they were completely different the same model because obviously the colorway makes them look a little bit different but it's called the um, adidas or ketro right this adidas or ketro 
and it's meant to be coming out in this nice navy color and to me personally just off the first look first impression does that not remind you of the current hype that people are having around um asics and stuff especially the model that jound is using at the moment i forgot what it's called right but this reminds me a lot of the Essex that are out at the moment um which is very interesting right because there was there was a time in life or a time in history when the two major players in sneakers in terms of nike and adidas were the ones that were setting the precedent they were setting the tone setting the tempo when it comes to shapes silhouettes and whatnot and all the other brands would just copy them would just basically do their own iteration of a adidas or a nike sneaker but now we're to the point where because kids and the newer generation or people in general are trying to get other sneakers, maybe because it's so difficult to get nice limited edition shoes from Nike Adidas because they make the drop scarce on purpose and create this false scarcity in order to drive up the resale and make you hyped and make you want to click stuff online and join flipping, um, you know, and like stuff on Instagram, all this nonsense and enter raffles. People have maybe decided with their wallet and be like, you know what, fuck it, in general, I'm just going to buy other shoes. So they're buying new balance they're buying a6 um you see people in deodoras nowadays feelers of course are coming back with a little resurgence reebok all this stuff just anything that's non-hype and non adidas and nike so maybe this is them recognizing it and be like hey we need to also get into this and um allow those and give that customer that would actually want that asset silhouette an opportunity to maybe buy our shoe because this definitely i would say um, would be something that would appeal to the kind of intellectual um, snob, no, the intellectual, the kind of, it would say in, an intellectual sneakerhead, right? Because that's how I think, that's why I think of people that wear like Solomons and stuff and all that malarkey. Or, they, or they're kind of reluctant sneakerheads. The ones that wear Solomons and Asics and stuff, they don't want to be looked at as a sneakerhead, but essentially they are because, you know, if you're buying three or four pairs of New Balances, you have to kind of, you know, you have to be okay with buying basically four of the same shoes, especially if you're buying the same model. They don't really differentiate that much between each other, right? A 574 is a 574, regardless of the colors you get it in, the shape doesn't really change. And most of the time, if you don't like bright colors, you have to stick with the neutral tone. So they're generally all going to look the same. So you're kind of deciding to purposely wear boring shoes because you don't want to wear the loud ones because you don't want to look like a hype beast or a sneakerhead, but you still are a sneakerhead because you're buying more than two shoes. So it's a weird place to be in. But I do see a lot of the fashion crowd who are into Ace, especially people who are into the, the Kiko Kostadinov ones. They'll definitely, I think, be fans of these also. These, um, what they, how do you pronounce the name of it again? Uh, Oketra. I think they'd be a fan of those going forward. I did hear somebody, I think the guy that runs a Streetway Night Live actually account was saying that he was considering um, taking off the three stripes here towards the front of the shoe. If you're not listening, if you're not watching the podcast, then the shoe itself is navy, a typical kind of runner type shoe. Think of again, think of an A6 with some kind of um, patterns and stripes on the upper, but essentially towards the front of the toe, there are these three stripes that essentially signify the Adidas three stripe. But if you were to take them off, they might maybe look a little bit more similar to what you maybe foresee at Asics, they maybe won't look as bit as brash as they do look there because they're kind of a bit obtuse in terms of the branding on the front there's a bit extra but he was considering maybe taking those off and i don't i think that might be a good idea actually even looking at it from here from the right foot that's on the floor we're looking down they do look a little bit much in it on the side there those kind of three stripes maybe they'd be better if they were tonal maybe it wouldn't be so um, hard to look at in terms of the shoe but the fact that they're grey or that the fact that they're free I think they might be 3M actually the fact that they look kind of 3M-ish they kind of stand out a little bit too much so I don't know why people are like fireworks now but it's what it is but yeah that's the talk going around there so definitely this are uh, the fact that they even somebody like shoot in that live is featuring them goes to show that they're definitely going to cater to people who would wear asics who would wear new balances and stuff the kind of you know instagram sneakerhead minimal sneak whatever you call that sneaker the one that isn't a jordan fan that alternate group of people i think they'll be a fan of these but i don't actually mind these but i just find it really funny and interesting that adidas is now copying the other brands who are making other shoes to try to k to try to give the customers another option now Adidas are also encroaching on their space also. It must be annoying if you're a flipping um, brand owner, isn't it? Um, of these kind of, of those smaller or those kind of brands that are not the top two, not the top three or top five, whatever it may be. You make your own shoe, you try to get kids into it. You, you know, it, it took probably a long time for A6 to get any kind of foothold in the youth market. They finally have, uh, they got some good collaborations under their belt. They got Kiko working underneath their wing, producing his own line of A6 that always sell out. And then now Adidas come in with all their resources, all their money, and they're now making uh, or, or trying to encroach on your space by really basically making a version 
version of your shoe because if you didn't see those three stripes and someone just told you what and told you to name the brand you know randomly you'd probably think they were asics too so it's a bit wild really to see that we're living in a weird world where adidas are now copying um flipping asics and the stuff that they're doing it's absolutely nuts to be honest um but i do like the shun Wotherspoon model i think they look pretty decent i think these actually might be one of his best shoes that he's put out apart from the sambas which i like i know some people don't like the look of the sambas but this version i've got here on the screen is a shun Wotherspoon versions allegedly i'm assuming this is an early sample um it's essentially in a essentially got loads of pinks and blues and whites the midsole is sort of like in this kind of dyed um off-white yellowy kind of style which a lot of brands do to basically mimic a vintage shoe there's some nice pops here nice bright orange stores at the back here i really like the fact that it's all mesh on the upper it's beautiful there's a little logo here maybe that's his name they've still got the three straps on the side there look a bit ugly which might would be the reason why he's kind of hiding them and putting his toes that way but that straps inside i don't really like but the colorway is really really beautiful i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie it might be one of his better adidas collaborations he's done um you got here adidas was that adidas prime or print there towards the end um or formation maybe it's called you got mesh all over it but yeah this looks fucking beautiful i'm not going to lie it looks really really nice with sean Wolverine version so hopefully we see them soon no idea on dates or anything we don't really know that we're not going to really go that far in terms of knowing the dates or stuff because you know they never really tell us until it's time for them to take the money out of our pockets but for sure these two models that we see now see those three stripes on the, on the outside don't look that great in it definitely is worth taking them off i think the stripes here they definitely look far better without the stripes although that colorway looks really nice with the yellow addition onto it but take away those, those three stripes in the front and they might be a go and the logo here as well on the top um, and then we've obviously got the um, example of the Sambas that are due to come out very soon from Sean Wolverspoon also. But yeah, let's see Wagwan when they come out. Let's see Wagwan when they eventually come out. Um, next on list here. Let's look at this. So this is um, a new article courtesy of Vice that's been causing a little bit of bother online especially in the dance music scene that i am kind of involved in and a fan of and this is regarding beat poor and their conduct um with their staff members and whatnot and this is uh courtesy of vice the title is former beat Boy employees alleged toxic workplace where fear roared a uh, the powerhouse dance music retailer preached um exclusivity and diversity but ex-staffers say bullying sexism and casual racism was per was pervasive this is an article written by annabella ross who you most guys would know for writing some really cool and scathing articles concerning some people within dance music and just exposing the kind of rotten underbelly that's seen seems to perpetuate um this scene and seems to kind of make it a little bit unfun to kind of be um, associated with but essentially it's quite hilarious anyway because you know all this stuff that people were doing in terms of you know pretending that they were you know for inclusivity and diversity i don't think anyone with actual actual brains would actually believe any of this stuff especially if it's a big business that's got massive turnover and is you know generating loads of money and high revenue whatever it may be i thought these were always buzzwords whenever a brand you know pops up a logo or a flipping um, vinyl letter sticker outside of their shop window with the lgbt plus colorways and stuff i never think that they you know i never think that they've completely ridded their company of bigotry of you know um homophobia or whatever it may be i just think it's them trying their best to uh acclimate to this new society that we live in where people in general don't really stand for no lack of public inclusivity whether that happens behind the scenes and stuff they don't stand for it publicly they kind of react to it very negatively so in order to protect themselves and inoculate themselves from any kind of backlash they put a flag up they paint something they give you a pin whatever it may be just so you leave them alone they're essentially signs or badges to please look i'm, I'm obeying you guys i'm agreeing what you guys say leave us alone don't hassle me let me run my business but they don't essentially um represent the thoughts feelings ideas point of views way of life um acceptance of people that run the company at all zero i get no insight about what the company's culture or what they stand for at all because they decide to you know put a black square on their feed or have a rainbow flag somewhere on their window it just doesn't make any sense i never thought that was the case but if people did think that was the case and they were living in la la land then i'm sorry that your reality has been shattered but anyway this is courtesy of vice so it says as follows it says it was june 24 2020 ava a label manager at the online music electronic uh store beatport was dreading an up-and-coming zoom meeting on the company's social activism <laughs> 
I don't know people who work in companies where you have to talk about politics and stuff and get involved in this kind of stuff. But I personally don't think it's the right way to go about things personally, because I don't think it's the right way to go about it. You're always going to offend somebody. Somebody's always going to think that you're not doing enough. And in general, I just don't think it's the place for businesses or corporations to try to get themselves involved in social issues to that extent. If you want to, you know, lend some money you want to start up an initiative whatever it may be so be it but conversating and talking about the world's problem at workplace it just serves no purpose whatsoever because for the most part there's very very little businesses like beatport can do for the wider problems that you know um, pollute our world at the moment what can they do about systemic racism really what can they do about um police brutality really what can they do like not much they can bring attention to things that we see in the news and whatnot but are you really going to be poor to find out about another cop that killed another black kid probably not you're going there to try your best to kind of unplug from the daily horrors of life you don't want to go there and be reminded again about some horrible thing that you saw online because who can stand that who can stand to be completely be bombarded with horror after horror after horror i can't i know i can't i know it's horrible to see we all saw the images of george floyd we know how terrible that was we don't want to again perpetuate that at work again who wants to go through that i don't know what workplaces you work at but usually when something terrible happens in the news you don't spend the entire day talking about it at work you might talk about it in the morning but then by the afternoon you kind of want to forget about it and just talk about your weekend talk about where you're gonna go on a holiday talk about how your boyfriend's hassling you whatever it may be anything but what's going on in politics but some people I guess just have that thing about them where everything they do is political everything they do has to be political and I think that is really the worst way to go about things I think if anything especially for people who are already bigoted this actually turns them against you this actually makes them less sympathetic or less sympathetic to your point of view and to what you want to do and the changes you want to make they don't understand it because they can't you know they can't even get where you're coming from anyway and now you're annoying them it just doesn't make any sense so imagine setting up a zoom meeting with your superiors about social activism it just seems insane to me but anyway continue ava's name has been changed to protect her privacy okay cool completely air out a company maybe you know effectively maybe in some way affect their flipping stock price maybe put people's jobs at risk because you're you know tarnish them with the brush and making them look like they might be bigots and racist and whatnot but then hide my name <laughs> it's like come on anyway let's continue like many companies suddenly grappling with george floyd's protest beatport was exploring what it could do to improve its approach to issues and race and diversity um ava one of the few black employees at beatport's berlin office yo how many people how many black people even live in berlin in the first place why even mention that how many black people live in berlin how many black people that live in berlin are actually into dance music how many of those people who are into dance music want to work in dance music industry? Like the fact that they're mentioning it as if they're meant to have like a hundred black people are working in there is nuts. There's not even a hundred flipping. Are there even a hundred top DJs that are black in the industry in the scene anyway? Can you think of them? A hundred, hundred of off the off rip like that play all the time. Not the old ones. Like ones that are like let's say ones who are like eighteen to thirty five. Are there a hundred anyway out there? And I'm, no light skinned people or mixed race involved no one pretty also black like me like do they are they even a hundred i don't think so <laughs> so the fact that they're pointing it out like this is just really weird but hey let's continue um one of the few black employees at beatport's office was among the approximately approximately sorry eight staff members from the german and american offices attended the department meeting with ceo rob mcdaniels I guess Rob McDaniels doesn't sound like somebody who's from the culture, but let's continue. Um, after Floyd's death, Ava had been talking with her peers and other music companies, including SoundCloud and Spotify. Ava, Ava's going in there and infecting every company with this rhetoric. I mean, Jesus Christ. I felt that people's response was lagging behind those of the rest of the industry. Like, what, what do you want to say? Um, on, honestly, I'd rather they said nothing than that black square. That black square was so insulting incredibly insulting and most of those companies that were putting the black square up what have they done since then absolutely jack shit that's what i did done jack shit it continues on may 3rd 2020 she emailed mcdaniels it's i thought it was mcdonald's she emailed mcdaniels who joined beatport ceo um in 2017 to ask him how the company intended to address the black lives matter protest in a phone conversation later that day ava said mcdaniels told her that beatport wouldn't post about blm on social media because they felt that it would alienate their core customer base <laughs> who's your core customer base mate fucking <laughs> aryan race why does he think it's going to alienate their core customer base like that's a mad response 
<laughs> okay, now nah, maybe I'm on Ava's side here. In response to Ava's claim, McDaniels told Vice that he never said he was worried about putting off customers with ProBLM Post, but that he sought not he sought out input from others as to whether or not a customers and communities saw it as a role. You see, that's what usually happens in most companies. Usually, the most senior. That's why you should. That's why you should always respect your bosses and senior people in your company um, on a case by case basis. Don't respect people just off based off their title and their seniority alone, because most of them are pussies. This guy is a CEO of a company, right? I know he's not there from the start, but he's a CEO, and he's essentially passing the blame to others in the company not taking responsibility for his words or what he might have said or maybe trying to clarify what he said he's saying other people told me not to do it that's why i didn't do it the ceo is doing this i know it's a hot button topic and he's a bit scared but this goes to prove that you should never ever lick the ass or suck the dick of people based on their title or how much they earn in a job especially when you're in these kind of industries you want to get a promotion you feel like you have to suck no 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 try to get to those positions by just your hard work and your diligence and your talent alone don't try and do all that pally pally stuff because for the most part these senior people are just dickheads they're just there because they've, they're older than you and they have more experience whatnot or they've kind of they know more people in the industry but it's not exactly that they're based on merit and skill alone and most of them you know don't do much anyway day to day they come in late they leave early like just take the piss you know what i mean Look at this guy, CEO, and he's flipping blaming other people. If if you if you said what you said, stand on it. Don't now try and blame others. Anyway, it continues. On the call, Ava said she pointed out to McDaniel's that two ble two beat ports, highest selling musical genres for house and techno, originated from black and LGBT communities. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. The house and techno that's sold on fucking Beatport is not black and LGBTQ friendly at all. It's not. Let's be honest. The people that play those type of music are not even black or LGBT themselves. The audiences they play for are not black and LGBTQ. Like, let's just be fair. Maybe the origins, okay, fair enough. But the music sold on Beatport. Let's be honest, man. This is not hard wax. This is Beatport. Oh, fucking hell. Anyway, it continues. The quote says, it felt like I was giving the CEO an elementary history lesson about black origins and techno. <laughs> I know that his CEO is a bit of a pussy, but imagine being lectured to by one of your subordinates about black history. Honestly, man, this stuff is hilarious to me. Anyway, let's continue. Said Ava, noting that Daniels, McDaniels did not seem to know of the Bill Bill Free of the Belleville Free, sorry, the innovator, the inventors of Tech Digital Techno. I don't think most people, actually, let me let me ask my own audience here. Do any of you people know who the Belleville Free are? Please let me know in the comments down below. If you know who the Belleville Free are, can you name them? Name each of them. First name and last name, please. It continues. I also had to explain how Techno was inherently political when it was adopted by white spaces after the fall of the Berlin Wall. He did not seem to know. Oh my God. My head's hurting, man. My head is literally hurting at this shit. The Belleville Free was made up of the... Okay, we're going to skip that because I want you to say in the comments. Um, the nine days, they made the trips to Detroit in Berlin and Chicago music. Okay, they gave us a hitch lesson on there. A challenging conversation about okay let's continue as challenging conversations about systemic racism unfurled across the world Ava found it galling that the beat pool was profiting from the marginalized peers pioneers of the scene oh my god man oh my god I'd love to know how much how many tunes from the Belleville Free people even sells on a day-to-day -day basis? It's probably not a lot. Most people that are going on there are basically buying fucking a media lens techno. Do you know what I mean? They're not going to go buy Belleville Free techno. Let's be all, let's call a spade a spade. Anyway, while appearing to not want to say or do anything that might alienate people's core, <laughs> this is crazy, man. The fact that he said I don't want to alienate my audience is hilarious. That means he's basically saying what? He doesn't want to alienate the tech house bros. Are all tech house bros Tories? That's really strange, isn't it? That you'd think. Anyway, this is it. People's core customer base of straight white bros, as she remembered it. McDaniel seemed to get defensive about the invocation of black music history, retro, uh, ret ret retorting that he knew black people were involved. <laughs> I know some of you blacks like a bit like, like a bit of the techno as well. Trust me, I know, I know. I went to a couple of black people in the scene. <laughs> I would never say something as ignorant as that, McDaniels wrote for Vice, calling the allegation false. When McDaniels was asked by Vice if he was familiar with the Belleville Free, he said that he wasn't, but that he knew the origins of House and Techno in Chicago and Detroit and that he was, and that there are sounds of the streets of black neighborhoods. <laughs> Let me read that again. The origins of House and Techno in Chicago and Detroit and that these are the sounds of the streets in black neighborhoods. Yo, <laughs> this guy... <laughs> 
honestly, it's honestly on you if you go to apply for a job at these places and you allow yourself to be subjected to this nonsense around these people. These are the kind of people who, if you came in with your hair braided, will start touching it, asking you questions. Is it yours? How long did it take? That looks really good. I should maybe get it. What does it smell like? Like all that nonsense, right? These are the type of people that we do in that stuff too. These type of people where if someone got stabbed, they'll be asking you about what your feelings are about it, even if you don't know who the person was. They'll be talking about like, I don't know, nonsense kind of like chad bro humor about spices and seasoning and all that nonsense and shit like just really n annoying lame conversations so the fact that you allow yourself to work i know people have to work in and earn a salary but this already you know i don't think people like this they don't turn into these guys you for sure have heard some of their you know quips and sayings beforehand before the whole george floyd thing happened in the first place or the george floyd tragedy happened i don't think these guys turn into these donuts overnight i don't think so these guys are like this from from day dot but oh my god man these guys are awesome anyway he later sent a follow-up email writing i googled <laughs> honestly the fact that somebody that runs don't you find it hilarious the fact that somebody runs the biggest online dance music um platform in terms of selling music in the world has no idea who the belleville free are is legitimately insane and the fact that he would admit to vice that he had to google it is wild immediately it felt like a dummy because of course i know okay cool i just forgot their names I forgot the name of the group. Yeah, okay, sure, mate. <laughs> anyway, in May 30, 2020, email to Ava McDaniels thanked her for an earlier chat and reading she had provided. So this Ava girl sent her CEO article links and readings for him to kind of get read up on on why it's important to maybe respect black voices in dance music. <laughs> you should, at that point, you should just quit. You really should just quit. Like, why are you sending this guy articles so that he could be less racist? I don't know. Let's continue. Or ignorant or whatever. Suggested, um, and suggested setting up interviews with influential DJs to talk about their experiences with racial injustice and promote on people's social channels. Oh my days. He ended the email with a post, with a postscript that says, PSA CEO friend just sent this, sent me this, including a link to a YouTube video called Life of Privilege Explained in Hundred in a Hundred Dollar Race. In the viral video, Adam Doyens, a white Christian educator, asks a group of young people to step forward each time they can answer yes to a question about their background. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in your home. Eventually, the demonstrations of privilege, black students were visibly segregated at the back and white students at the front. The video that Daniels wrote is a good summary of the underlying systemic issues and protest and violence who don't solve these oh my god the fact that a grown adult that runs a company or that is a ceo of a company of beatport has no idea what systemic racism is again you don't need to agree with it but the fact that you don't know what it is or how it can affect different marginalized groups is insane the fact that you need a youtube video to tell you this and he's probably what i'm gonna say mcdaniels is at tops 50 years old tops tops 50 years old so running an online platform like Beatport is predominantly online. It's social media heavy. You have to be somewhat plugged into kind of youth culture and what's going on online and society and shit. It's not like you're running a fucking newspaper. Do you know what I mean? So the fact that he has no idea what systemic racism is and he had to get sent some viral video that was trending on YouTube to fight, to kind of get explained to him in dummy terms is says everything about the guy. So I don't know why Ava stayed there so long at the company, to be honest. I would have left ASAP. This is absolutely insane. Legitimately one of the most insane articles I've ever read in my entire life. But it also goes to show, like, in general, all this talk about exclusivity in the scene and stuff is what is a waste of time because most of these guys don't care. Most of these guys don't know. And most of these guys just, I don't know, live in their own bubble. So it's less really a, a conversation about respecting the history of black contributions to this culture and whatnot. And we founded it. It's less about that and, that. and it's more so about, hey, let's just try to get involved. Let's also try to get a piece. Because, you know, for myself, I think there's a viral tweet going around where somebody was like saying, oh, why is it that, you know, all the, all the light skinned girls basically get to be DJs? We don't see many dark skinned girls in it. And it could be applied to men also, right? In general, right? You, you see a lot of the good looking mixed race light skin dudes who basically look like male models being able to, pro, you know, DJ and professionally in a very short space of time. While people who look myself are not really that 
you know, um, common when you look at some of the big lineups in some of the big places around the world. Now, again, like I said before, it's mostly a selection thing, right? I'm sure there's probably not that many DJs out there who are black who play that type of music in those kind of places in the first place. I'm assuming it's a small pool, but still the fact that those places, you know, promote themselves to be bastions of inscrutivity and diversity and representation, it is a bit weird when some of those spaces only have a very whitewashed lineup, especially also when you think about the audiences that go to their parties parties you think about the people that attend the raves and shit and it's all just meh do you know what I mean so like I think of the possession party that went to an E1 a while back and you know the crowd was very diverse right very um a melange of people from all over the world from different sexual orientations you know the way they kind of um uh, I'm sure pronouns whatever it may be right all over the world all over the place but the lineup was very whitewashed it would it didn't really represent the crowd at all and that happens a lot in a lot of dance music festivals even think of something like um Tomorrowland the amount of girls that go to Tomorrowland is quite plentiful there's a lot of Instagram accounts dedicated to just celebrating all the sexy girls that go to Tomorrowland but how many girls have you ever seen play at Tomorrowland apart from the usual the usual lot the charlotte the wits and amy the lens amy lens amelia lens and stuff there's not many so even places like that where they cater to like a predominantly european audience they also don't even you know in include gen other genders apart from men <laughs> i mean it's always just men playing for a cascade of girls who are scantily clad and whatnot but you would imagine a place like that if they if they actually propped up some girls who are part of the local scene who are up and coming it would actually make the festival far better any other experience um for sure but hey this is what it is what do i know what do i know it continues it says by the time the june 24th meeting commenced ava was on edge her fears were real okay all this happened before the meeting all this happened before that incredible Zoom meeting. Oh my God. Her fears were realized when a conversation on systemic racism veered towards slave trade and colonialism. Yo, if I'm going to work and I'm, and I'm in a Slack or I'm in a Zoom call and you start talking about the slave trade and colonialism, I'm closing that window. Send as many emails as you want. Send me as many DMs. Are you online? Are you online? I'm closing that window and I might even go and appear offline. I'm not being lectured to or being subjected to a conversation about the slave trade at my place of work. Generally, most of us don't even want to work, right? We only work because we have to pay the bills. We have to keep a roof over our head. So we do it our pure necessity, right? Ob obligation to our family, to our friends, whatever it may be, to ourselves. We don't do it because we love to do it. Some of us have the privilege of being able to work in a company or in a, you know, have a vocation that we actually love, but most of us do it only to pay the bills. So if you think I'm going to be somewhere where I only have to pay, only there because I've got to pay the bills and I want to sit there and talk about, you know the slave trade and shit you are having a laugh mate you're having a laugh you want you want me to sit there and talk about uh, the latest flipping to hunt tanahisi coast article fuck off um he said that african tribesmen have been killing <gasps> oh my god he said the african tribesmen had been killing each other since the dawn of day she recorded so basically what, what is honestly yo this is like this is definitely blue lives matter this is definitely giving blue lives matter this is definitely giving um you know black people should stop having you know black women should stop having babies and shit um you know black people kill more black people than white people do this is like those republican <laughs> right wing talking points um she recorded it, said, it was a it was a more stunning to ava that the ceo's comments came in the midst of a meeting um ostensibly meant to in part to address people's response to the ex extrajudicial violence um against black people Okay, this is what I don't like. Often arising from demon stereotypes and them really violent. You can't ask your company to talk about, you know, violence against black people in polit in politics now at the moment in society and then get mystified when the response is something crazy like this. Because they're in this again, they're nuts, but they're they're in the same universe, these these comments. They're in the same universe. They're obviously on different sides of the universe, but definitely in the same universe. Um I'm just surprised that he'd say it so brazenly. I Ava felt that her face burning. She asked McDaniels to name these African tribes. <laughs> he just said that he was a history expert and she recounted um he said, Have you watched he probably said, Have you watched Toby as a slave? <laughs> she didn't say much for that at the rest of the meeting. I'm surprised he didn't say like more African tribes sold African tribes sold out their own people more than white people hurt black people. I don't know. Oh my god. McDaniels told advice that this recollection was completely false. Okay. So she made up everything. He said he did not single out African tribesmen and that he thought the conversation was about protests in Colombia. What? And within the context of violence happening everywhere in the world, South Africa, unfortunately, is not immune to that. So he's saying because there's protests in Colombia, it means Africa shouldn't be what? Oh, yo, this guy is... 
Honestly, this guy's the CEO of Beatport. Anything's possible. That's what I'm saying. That, that's why sometimes it's good we have these people in society, the likes of him, it sounds like, the likes of Boris Johnson, the Donald Trump. Say what you want about them as political people, but whatnot. But just in terms of them, you know, and their kind of intellect and whatnot, it's nice to see because they occupy the highest positions in the world or in society, yet they're absolute oafs. So it should give you hope in wherever your where wherever field your work you're in that you can achieve great things. Because if they can do it, if you can become CEO of Beatport, what's stopping you from becoming an area manager of whatever store you're working in or general manager here or head of this or whatever it may be? You can always progress upwards because there are generally so many dummies occupying crazy roles. It doesn't even make any sense. Because I, I would beggar, beggar, I, I really would debate and I'd really not believe that this guy being this dumb is somehow super smart in his role. I'm assuming his um, ignorance and his dumbness definitely seeps into his day-to-day -day work for sure. There's no way you can turn it on and off. You can't be talking about African tribesmen and shit <laughs> and blaming them for systemic racism and also then go and do your job and be a really high class, top of the tier CEO that's been headhunted by all the big companies. It doesn't happen that way. He's probably an idiot as well when it comes to generally working in his own role i'm sure of it anyway continued by another colleague tracy whose name has been changed for privacy reasons was also in a meeting and supported ava's recollection she remembered being so shocked that she almost didn't believe her ears until after ava asked mcdaniels to name the tribes i was like fuck this is real she said what is what is this kind of view like so dated um <sighs> Sounds somebody that sounds like somebody might have a black boyfriend. Anyway, it continues. After the meeting, Tracy said that Ava reached out to her on Slack to vent about what happened. <laughs> Imagine the, the conversation you're having after on Slack when someone says that. She said, I can't believe this. This is what it's like. Okay. What is this? What I heard? This is true. That's McDaniels, of course. Um, for those seeking a career in industry, getting a job at Beatport felt like scoring a golden ticket. In 2004, the company was established in Denver um, as the first online electronic music store um, of its kind. Employees, many of its hobbyist DJs and music enthusiasts were often starry eyed at the prospect of leaving and breathing electronic music. Duh, duh. As a 24 year old new to Berlin who didn't, wouldn't want to work in a place like Beatport, said Brie, whose name has been changed. As cheesy as it sounds, it was a dream job. I love music, I love meeting people in music, I love traveling to clubs and seeing artists, and this job that I was promised on paper sound like it would allow me to do all these things be put as industry leader <laughs> there's also a part of me just to pause there's also a part of me that thinks that this is a little bit insane to be complaining about right the fact that your workplace isn't politically again what what they're saying is nuts what they're saying is obviously abhorrent it's obviously ignorant it's obviously bigoted it's obviously racist it's obviously insane right clearly we all know this let's not beat around the bush it's clear easy point to make duh but it's also a bit insane, given the given the climate that we're in at the moment, given the levels of unemployment, given how hard it is out there to get a job, right? I know from myself and my own experience, um, it took me a while to find a job that I finally have at the moment. I was unemployed for the you know for the majority of the first part of the fucking pandemic, and it was awful, especially when we were under lockdown and there was nowhere to go. You had to sit in your own apartment, house, room, whatever it may be, for hours on end, staring at yourself, not getting haircuts, looking horrible, ordering Uber Eats and shit, and living off savings. It was horrible, horrid, 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 horrid. Mentally, physically, everything, spiritually, it was disgusting. So when you did finally end up getting a job it was a real score and it really kind of i think that experience for me anyway changed how i saw employment i think i always saw employment as like a means to an end i always kind of saw it as like a no i'm just doing this for the time being because i'm going to end up doing my creative thing that i want to do and this is something i don't really take too seriously and i think most people who are involved in the arts and entertainment and stuff have that general view when it comes to their day-to-day -day employment but then when i wasn't employed for a while i then suddenly switched and flipped and was like no 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 this is my bread and butter. This is the thing that's legitimately given me the ability to do the things that I want to do in terms of entertainment, in terms of booking shows, making things, whatever it may be. So I'm going to treat this and I'm not I'm going to treat this with care. I'm not going to take this for granted. I'm going to make sure I do my very best to be the best employee or colleague I can be so I can keep this job for as long as possible so that I have the ability to continue doing my other stuff outside of work. And then whenever that pops off, it pops off. But it's not like you're treating it like whatever and then you're in the hope that that thing goes off whenever because it takes a while for your kind of like side gig to pick up and get where it needs to get to and i think most people have had that sort of shift so for somebody who's extra privileged who has not only got a job but also got a job at one of the premier you know companies within the dance music scene a small niche right but one of the biggest platforms out there um that's monopolized the entire industry for the most part right i'm not surprised record stores even exist with the amount of inventory and 
tunes and whatnot that Flipping Beatport, you know, has on their platform and the amount of money has obviously been invested in it. It's, it's a very easy site to use and all that sort of stuff. All that stuff costs money. So to be in this time, to be in this, um, to be in that position and to sit there and, and complain about your boss essentially being a bit of a donut, uh, being a bit of a dinosaur and being a little bit of a dick and an oaf is a little bit wild because we haven't heard anyone saying anything about them stopping them getting promotions. We haven't heard anyone talking about, you know, working conditions being awful. All we've heard is that when they tried to bring up race and politics post George Floyd, management responded negatively, responded badly, didn't really represent their views, blah, 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 blah. But we haven't heard anything that really affected their work. I know people say, oh, that doesn't affect their work. No, no. In terms of stopping their progression, in terms of not giving them space to grow, to learn, to ask questions, and, you know, to feel empowered, blah, 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 all those buzzwords. We haven't heard that. All we've heard is that the management didn't really feel too tough, didn't feel too, you know, great about BLM. And now in the 2020 world, there's many black people out there that also don't feel too great about BLM either, right? And you only have to look at the recent expose behind the founders and how they misuse the funds allegedly and stuff. It's not really the most, um, um, it's not, it doesn't really have the cleanest image nowadays either itself. So it's all a bit murky, but part of me does feel like it's a little bit, not to even say disrespectful, it just feels a little bit, weird to be complaining about stuff like this now given what's happening in the world it just feels like a weird time to bring this up this is something that should have been brought up within the the time post george floyd around that same year right but now it just feels a little bit like what is the intention what is the point of this in the first place what do they want to do overhaul the entirety of the management behind Beport and have people that represent them more running it and stuff day to day will they be able to sustain that company will they be able to keep that that train rolling i don't know like how much does it generate here it says total revenue was 41 million in 2020 that's a serious business so maybe these guys are dickheads when it comes to knowledge on societal issues but when it comes to business they know what they might be doing who knows to replace them with people that you might think are more inclusive and representative will that necessarily make the company profitable will it maybe affect people's jobs going forward in the future i don't know it just feels a little bit weird i just gotta be honest because they were saying it's a dream job but they don't represent their views um in terms of political and societal it's just like i don't think you're ever going to get that everywhere in life and i think you have to decide especially when you're an adult um where you separate because the same thing with having family members you have we all have family members who have some really crazy views who have who are definitely not left-leaning um, but you learn to live with them you learn to put up with them for the most part if you're a grown-up if you're not a grown-up you, you throw a hissy fear and you're like i'm not talking to you again i know many people in the states did that right when trump was in office when they found out their family members voted for him and whatnot some of them haven't spoken to each other in years and i think that's ridiculous i mean to be not talking to your flipping family members because they voted for a guy it's like nonsense but for the most part you learn to live with it so i don't know i just don't like this complaining i don't like it all it's like it's about jobs especially when people are suffering out there like it's just i don't know Anyway, continue to scroll by that one. Uh, recently, but yeah, but, 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 but promote image. Yes, yeah, so anyway, that was a funny bit, right? But the other funny bit I thought was really hilarious was this. Cursive of RA. It says the Black Artist Database suspends partnership with Beat Paul following allegations of racism, bullying, and sexism. I just find it hilarious that a platform like the Black Artist Database, which is called BAD, um, acronym, didn't do any due diligence, no research, no auditing, nothing behind the scenes to find out who they were aligning themselves with in the first place when it came to setting up the black artist database or having it integrated with Beatport. It's absolutely insane. But it's also hilarious that Beatport would, essentially, would, would really run at the opportunity and snap um, the black artist database's hands off to get linked up with them because they knew behind the scenes what people without running it are really about so this was a great way to kind of like you know inoculate them in terms of pr wise and make them look like they're inclusive and that they are with the culture and they're with everything they know what's going on bloody blah 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 but behind the scenes they're doing what their annabelle ross article said i find that fucking hilarious like really really hilarious anyways it's courtesy of ra it said the uh, black eyes database has suspended its relationship with beatport um editorial arm beat portal with immediate effect uh bad release a statement earlier today august 24th via instagram the decision was made in response to a vice article yesterday that details allegations of workplace racism bullying and sexism at beatport um 
the, the launched in October 2021, BAD and Beatport relationship began with the Beatport integration of BAD. On August the 1st, BAD co-founder Nix launched a month-long guest editorship on Beatport with this letter. August cover star was Black Rave Culture. The Vice article remained Annabelle Ross accuses the several men in leadership position of Beatport, including CEO Robert Daniels and Chief Revenue Officer Jonas Temple and former Berlin Officer General Manager Terry, whatever his name is, of casual racism, bullying and misogynistic behaviour towards staff. Right, cool. The accusers accept some of the allegations and not others. And then you look at what um, what beat poor is, what bad is about, right? Because I, I, I didn't really know too much about them. I remember seeing their name featured in places, but I didn't know too much about them. So it says as follows. Their mission statement. Black Artist Database, formerly known as Black Bandcamp, which is absolutely insane when you think about what Bandcamp is about, right? What Bandcamp is about, when I remember it, um, was that it was meant to be a platform where artists receive the most royalty in terms of percentage, right? Because I guess if you go and stream an artist's music on Spotify, they get a really small percentage of the revenue that generated from those streams. And same with Apple Music and whatnot. But Beatport, Bandcamp, sorry, sold themselves under the premise that we only take like 20% and they get 80 or something along those kind of lines, right? Um, so you're essentially putting money directly into the artist's pocket by having this one-stop shop where you can shop many different artists, many different genres, blah, 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 blah. And it was always kind of, I feel like for me, represented the underground, the kind of alternative people, people who are non-commercial, which by proxy, I would imagine would be people of all walks of life. It wouldn't just be white people. So to think, to set up a platform and call it a black band camp is insane because it's as if like the niche of the niche, which is band camp, is still not enough to represent you. You need another thing to represent you. It's like you're, you're othering yourself again, but then you also want to be involved. It just it just feels a bit backwards to me. It really does. But again, what do I know? It's a community-based platform hosting um, a wealth of international black-owned record labels, artists, producers, and bands. This crowdsourced database provides an easy-to-search filter and directly support the creative output of black artists globally via their online profiles. The database is continuous work in progress maintained by volunteers and paid administrators it's hilarious in a way because this is the kind of thing that i would imagine like a festival like field or something would get in trouble because they put a, a lineup out that was all white and then somebody involved in the booking team would search black djs they'd get black database and then go through people just find someone cool that they could kind of see who's got dreads who's got a tattoo whatever somebody yeah and they just book them it wasn't based on anything about you know, learning about the artists, do you actually like them? Just kind of ticking off boxes, which is quite disgusting. I'm not going to lie. Do you know what I mean? Especially for myself, being a black DJ myself, I'm like, would I be happy with being the token person on the lineup if it meant that I got to play? Because I, now I don't play at all, especially post-pandemic. Would I be okay with being tokenized or would I want to be only on a lineup on merit? And to be honest, as somebody who's bereft of bookings, who hasn't played a paid gig in months, somebody who was playing every single month before the pandemic, right? I would say on hand on heart, I would much rather play on merit than play based on my skin color or my race or whatever. Honestly, there's no way that I'm ever going to be okay with being played just off the sake of my flipping race and whatnot, just as a token, even if it's going to be at Bergheim, even if it's going to be at fucking Dick Mantle, Boomtown, Houghton. No, I'd much rather get there off on merit of my skill, my application, my hard work, my diligence, my personality, <clears throat> than my flipping race. Oh yeah, cool black guy, weird hair, he wears glasses, let's put him behind the booth. Fuck that, I don't want that. But some people do. And maybe that's a way to start. I don't know. But I just think it's really gross. Um, it's like a, 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 a library of... Like, imagine if a white person started one. Like, you just imagine the outrage. <laughs> I don't know. I just I just don't know. I don't know. The database was started um, as a community effort on the 4th of June as a black band camp on the 5th of May, June 21. The project launched as Black Day Artist Database, a move which will hope to expand the project's scale and scope. Da, 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 da. Right? Or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I just think that's hilarious that they didn't do any research on Beatport and what they were about. But let's read um, bad statement regarding all the stuff we've heard about Beatport. So bad said as follows. They said, in light of the allegations regarding the safety of Beatport's workplace for black <laughs> safety. <laughs> These words are funny because you think about what the guy said about black tribesmen. Oh, uh, it's not even black people's safety it should be his safety if he said that to me and he was in my face i'd headbutt him do you know what i mean it's not even our safety it's their safety like what black tra anyway let's continue um black employees highlighted in the piece published by vice yesterday alleging racist sexist and bullying behaviors by people's management black artist database is immediately suspending 
partnership between ourselves and Beat Portal pending further internal review. Once we have conducted our internal review, we'll return with a further course of action. So they haven't even made a final decision yet. The money and the opportunity is so good that they're still hesitant to really pull the cord completely. I think that article is pretty solid. I wouldn't, you know, maybe there's some embellishing here and there, but I think generally what they said about the guys and the senior team and what they said around Black Lives Matter and stuff is probably true, right? They probably think that way. You would have to imagine. So it's like, it's no surprise really. And it's like, it's like rocking up to a guy at a tech house rave and asking him about, you know, if he believes in gay rights and shit, you might get some spicy responses. You should know that, right? But people that go to this kind of, it shouldn't be shocking to you. It shouldn't be, you know, whatever. Um, so the fact that they're not making the final decision now is pretty, pretty hilarious, but maybe they have, they have some procedures they have to go through, whatever. We draw significant support from the shared experiences of our community and we remain faithful to our goal of amplifying these voices and experiences. Um, further to the, those sentences just don't mean anything, can it? These kind of, what, is, what does that even mean? Like, what does that whole sentence? What does that whole sentence or paragraph mean, in general? What does it mean? Anyway, let's just continue. Um, further to this, we are very sad to announce that we have to cancel our planned BAD presents the Carney dance on the Saturday, Sunday, the twenty. <laughs> oh, honestly, man, it's like for some reason I always thought again. This is really bad to say, right? But I always thought to myself, you know, those white guys who are really into like scar and stuff. I don't know why, but I always thought to myself, like, it was always, like, a really funny ruse to, like, protect yourself against claims of racism, right? To be like, I'm into ska, I'm into reggae. Those, like, white guys that wear, like, Dr. Martens and have, like, long sideburns and shit and wear, like, green and, like, jeans and, like, track jackets and polos. It's like a weird kind of, like, offshoot of the Proud Boys. It's, it's, it's a Proud Boy before the Proud Boy, right? Like, Proud Boys nowadays, you say, oh, I'm not racist. The founder of Proud Boy is black. You know, that kind of nonsense they say. I always thought um, the guys are into Sky and Reggae, the white dudes. I always like, but I know, I know they're not, but it was a bit weird to me. Those guys were, like, overly into Ska, Dub, Reggae and shit. Like, all right, relax, lad. But anyway, in the midst of the situation regarding B-Port, we were notified by the team at the glove that fits that our event could no longer run as planned due to a licensing issue. So allegedly, okay, but you know, let's. Con unfortunately, the timing has meant we were unable to secure another venue. So they wanted to keep it anyway. <sighs> let's keep reading. Um, we were unable to secure another venue as much as a care we applied to our event. So we have to make a decision to cancel. All purchases could be refunded. Many thanks to the team at Glove That Fits um, for their work. And thanks to apologies to our guest DJs who are there, blah, 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 and our special guest. For any comments, questions, and complaints about any of the above, please contact K. And then what's the next slide? Cancelled, cancelled. So yeah, in conclusion, people have some very ignorant, um, somewhat bigoted and racist people that run their company, from what I can see there, right, clearly. People that are uneducated and oafs and just kind of ignorant of what's going on around the world. Um, it would be a, definitely a company that if I was working at, you know, it, those things would come up pretty soon when you're working at a company like that those guys are guys that talk about life in general they're going to be you know the people that people like that usually don't know how dumb they are so they'll definitely be spouting off the you know off the mouth about certain topics so you definitely get an idea who they are and if you if i was to hear what they would say in passing at like a bar or something i would definitely have quit you know what i mean it wouldn't take him long especially if i'm that socially and politically minded you know i mean especially if that, that was kind of my whole world i'll definitely have quit a long time ago so for them to finally pluck up the courage to speak about it now or for this part article to publish so long after everything that's happened with that it just seems a bit insane um i don't really see the point around it personally maybe they do want to manage your change and stuff going forward i don't really know but i think this would have been far more effective around the time the George floyd thing happened in the first place um, that would have been a big wider conversation to have nowadays it just feels a little bit insane if anything it makes the black artist database look a bit nuts that they didn't do any due diligence before you know lining up with the beat portal and all that nonsense it makes a person that was working at beat port look a bit nuts for standing around there for so long i'm not it doesn't even say in the article if they're still there at beat portal or beat port i'm not too sure it just makes everybody look insane and in general what it does is it does kind of highlight and kind of amplify the issue at hand is that in general in dance music most people don't care about this diversity and representation shit especially when it comes to in terms of politics and whatnot i don't think we're going to win that conversation i don't think we're going to convince them of it in general i think the best way to go about it is just to say 
we need more representation in dance music in general because the, 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 the artists and the people who are on the lineup need to be more reflective of the people that go to these events and that listen to their music, watch their streams and whatnot. You can't, like I said, at the possession event I went to in E1, that possession event I went to E1 was really diverse. So, so many people from all walks of life that attended it, people from all different types of countries. But for some reason, the lineup was very, um, I would say, whitewashed with the exception of Charlie Sparks. I think maybe in the lineup there was, you know, basically the same or same opposition lineup that you always get and which is kind of kind of disappointing especially when you consider that they are they've essentially got the youth market by the bulls so we just want to see more representation same thing goes for awakening same things goes for the big festivals out there representation means highlighting people from other communities who aren't just a stereotypical white dudes that play these kind of things now i don't think that conversation should be a politically minded conversation because they just don't care it shouldn't be societal because they just don't care it should just be more so let's have the artists reflect the people that actually listen to this shit and maybe just maybe we might get them to listen maybe we might get them to listen but i think leading with this whole like politics black lives matter racism shit they just don't get it they really really don't because to them they feel like because black people exist and they're walking and breathing in the world it means racism doesn't exist you know what i mean they don't even like this guy didn't know what fucking systemic racism was he had to be sent a viral video of some challenge of stepping forward and stepping backwards to, to know what privilege is. he didn't want to know what privilege was bro like are you insane you cannot believe these things fair enough but not being aware of what they are and the, play, and the role they play in society is absolutely nuts and i think now this might have explained or ex this should have exposed how most people are in these positions who work in these places and i think the general consensus about most people is that they'd much rather have these dance music spaces or platforms be an escape from the drudgery of everyday life they don't want to be subjected to you know lectures and all that stuff about black lives matter about societal things because it eventually just makes them feel shit and no one wants to make no one wants to be made to feel shit and then get told to turn around and you know change how they act it's just not going to work that way so just force just force the representation more so in terms of let's just get in more representative of the crowd that go to events and let's not make it political but i thought the article was absolutely insane the people to people that run it are absolutely nuts and if anything it gives me confidence that i can achieve whatever i can achieve if that guy is a ceo of fucking people mcdaniel sounds like an absolute cunt <laughs> that goes without saying but yeah check it out the article if you want yourself um i'll put the link the article back up here so you can check it it's from vice the title of it is as follows former people employees allege a toxic workplace where fear ruled i'll put it in the flipping show notes so you can check it out sorry there it is on vice i'll check i'll put it out there so you can check it if you want i'll put it out there if you can check it anyway that was the excellent English show episode number 596 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual i'm going to end the show there and hopefully you guys have had a good one i'm sweating buckets now if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave a comment down below and of course if you're watching it or listening to it via audio platform podcast whatever it may be please share with your family and friends and let them know that i'm out here talking absolute gobbledygook 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 and i'll see you guys very soon if you listen to the audio show you're here tune in the day if you're watching the video it'll just go to black. Peace.